Good point. There was money involved. Yeah. So yeah. if I leased it, money. if I leased it to him and he paid money and you were making money on that, then he could hunt it. I'm still not grasping. Absolutely. Absolutely. Although I would not allow Paul Sawyer on my property. <laughs> uh, yeah, we understand. Yeah, I get. I know that. I know that. <laughs> I am. Gotta go easy on the old shoulder. That was a good one. That was a nice class. <laughs> the old uh, rotator cuff or whatever's going on there. What would you say, man? One out of ten. What's the pain? Oh, no. Keeping in First mind, of all, keeping in mind, ten is reserved for childbirth. Yeah. Nine is usually broken femur. So yeah. where, where yet? Uh, mm. I think I'm rocking like a five. Whoa. Yeah. That's bad. Yeah. And it's good this morning. Like most. Morning. First of all, welcome back, Hunter Podcast. Hey, forty-three, right? two. One. 43 something. <laughs> 43. Yeah. Cool. Uh, talking about shoulder. So um, is pro it's like two and a half, three weeks now. Two and a half weeks ago when we were in Columbus, um, I was hanging a set and had a, a stick slip out on me. And fortunately, I had my you know lineman's belt on so I didn't fall out of the tree. But I wrapped around one and I grabbed a branch on the other one just instinctively. And I think I you know, gave it a little bit of a, too much of a knock there. And I was fine. Like, and the cool thing is fortunately, right. And as long as it doesn't get any worse, I can still draw my bow. I can still hold like that motion is, is perfectly fine. It's when I go up. When you're fist bumping at the club. Can't do it. No more, no more Jersey Shore fist bumping. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No shoulder presses. That ain't happening right wow. now. So, yeah, we're just going to baby her for a little bit, but... Um, I guess they're doing a little more strength and conditioning, man. I, I had I, been, I know you got the cardio. That was the yeah. thing. I had been doing it right before that happened, which sucks because then it's like, okay, you've been doing it, and now I can't do shit. Set you back. But I did shoot my bow yesterday. I was just like, it's in my head now. I'm like, holy shit, like, what if I'm in a stand, big buck comes through, and I can't draw my bow? It's perfectly fine. You'll be all right. Like, but if I go... uh, I, I guess my concern now is running and gunning stands. Yeah. Because that takes a little to, bit. Strauss Lama's going to have to hang him for you. I saw your Instagram post the other day. So Strauss Lama in his natural <laughs> habitat. I was cracking up at that. <laughs> well, did, um, he's just out here grazing. Brian uh, Ewing texted me. Well, he called me the yeah. other day and he's like, hey, I just want to let you know what's going on. He uh, he's picking up a TV, like a, I don't know, big Samsung flat screen or something. And the, just the way that he picked it up, he said he, he picked it up by himself and he just heard a pop. And he like set it down immediately, and it was his bicep. I'm not sure if it was right or left. Wow. Uh, he goes to get the MRI, I think, today. Well, and see, I think that's where. But I'm, he's like, yeah, I'm shooting a crossbow. Like, I'm, that's, I can't lift it. I'm optimistic about it in that, um, like, I never felt a pop. And frankly, like, we, I hung stands after that. Yeah. I think he probably just pulled it out all, a little bit. And I think. Bruised. And it felt like it was getting better, and then I was tossing around. Uh, deer feed and stuff this weekend, and that just re-agitated Are you it. icing it at all? I am now. Should help. Yeah. Ice and ibuprofen. So, yeah. But it's, uh, we got a cold front coming, finally. Yeah. It's in sight. <laughs> um, <laughs> Too bad you'll be on a business trip. I know. I know, man. <laughs> Go figure, dude. Like, you, you texted me the other day, and you're like, uh, you said just like mass depression. the text the text out of nowhere was like uh, would you rather give up the last week of october or the first week of november and i was like was this a trick question i don't like the question was, <laughs> why what what are you asking me i don't know man it's just how it goes and you know and what's crazy right now is um i was supposed to actually leave tomorrow that's why we're doing this podcast a day early and um like you can't book a flight like literally it will not let you i've tried to book a flight three flights actually seven or eight different times it takes it but the basically what my bank is saying is that the merchant the airline is not processing the payment and then they're just canceling the flight and it's I, I assume because there's a lot of things in the news around mandatory vaccines and and pilots and stuff walking out southwest canceled like 2500 flights this week um and so and this was interesting a different business strategy well, uh, and we'll I see how it works out for them, Cotton. I think that they're trying at least this airline, uh, which is American. So, what are they going to do? Go out and find a bunch of more pilots that are vaccinated? No, they can't. They're they're literally deterring you. So, a flight that I had booked for seven hundred seven hundred fifty dollars round trip got canceled. So the next day, I was like, "Oh, I'll go back in and book this thing." Sixteen hundred dollars now round trip. They're just deterring you not to fly. 
so that they don't I mean, have that's to. A, that's a fine short term strategy. <laughs> well, I don't know. Government bails them out, anyways. Yeah. Another rabbit hole. But that said, There's so no supposed, happy ending to that one. I was supposed to travel. I won't be this weekend, so I'll probably take the boys out Saturday, maybe Sunday. We'll see in Ohio, and then uh, yeah. This we'll, wait, what? Yeah, this I don't have to travel. I'm not going to Phoenix because I can't fly. You're definitely not going. I can't fly. No. So you're coming up to the farm this weekend? Maybe Sunday. Right on. Cool. Yeah. So Saturday, I'm going to take the boys out Dude, behind Saturday the house. Saturday night looks good. Let's call Bob and get him to dump a corn pile in front of that blind for okay. the boys. Yeah, Saturday, Friday. Saturday, I'm definitely hunting at home in PA. Okay. Which day? Friday? Saturday. Saturday. And then Sunday, I'd probably go up to the farm. Sunday looks good. Yeah. So, and you then... Bring, a, you bring the boys. Sunday looks good. I leave the boys at home. <laughs> yeah, maybe. They probably don't want to get up early. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I got to travel. Okay. And then I'm back Thursday, and then... Sometime that week, I got to travel again. Okay. But I think I'll be in Kentucky, so I might hunt. So, anyways, you know, hunting is cranking. And, uh, you know, I wanted to take a second and thank everybody for kind of, I feel like our the podcasts are doing really well. Um, Don Higgins is doing well. Adam Hayes, which was, uh, came out, this is Wednesday, so Tuesday, last week, if you're hearing this now, um, are doing really well. So just appreciate everybody's support. And, uh, you know, still, I think, love us or hate us, but, cool <laughs> i'm having fun with them yeah, yeah. views or no views it's fun fun for us to do so that's I, I really wanted to comment uh, i hope they're listening now the comment this morning that basically was saying that we're just pieces of shit for talking trash on like pennsylvania which i don't understand that anyways but he said something about our balls being swollen and i really wanted to be like <laughs> did you see my balls <laughs> yeah i don't know there's nothing haters to gonna hate like baby that. yeah so anyways <laughs> we've got a cool guest today yeah. Um, somebody that I know that you and I have, have really kind of studied for a while now in terms of, you know, we, we said how he's just a very approachable guy, but, you know, a guy that literally, I think, started the movement of <clears throat> deer hunting real estate. Uh, and obviously somebody who's just so passionate about land ownership and you know, not just the hunting and management aspect of it, but just owning a piece of dirt. Um, yeah, I think he's one of the... I think he gets the credit for this, but I don't know if it's enough. Like he seems to be one of like the, the people with the passion who is the most contagious as far as um, property ownership. Yep. Um, you know, and they use that to fuel the, the business that they've grown. And so it's, it's whitetail properties and Dan Perez is the guy that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, uh, cause I can remember there was that whitetail properties intro that they did for the TV show. And it was just Dan narrating yeah. about his passion for, for land ownership. And it's, and it's true as can be, man. It's yeah. It's like, um, it's kind of chilling because it's like I can relate on on so many levels, and I think Dan is a lot further along in his his life mm -hmm. and his career, and he's he's seen a lot. But um, I can certainly uh, relate to a lot of of what he's saying there. Yeah. Well, let's uh, bring the guest in this week, Dan Perez, Whitetail Properties. <laughs> I always feel so bad making him wait yeah. <laughs> while, while we do this. Hey, Dan. Intros. We feel so bad making you wait there, Dan, while we do that. <laughs> Oh, no worries. It's relaxing. There you go, man. Well, we appreciate you being on the Hunter podcast today, Dan. And, um, you know, I want to start, Jared kind of really hit home on something in that opener and that you know, it was probably, I don't know how long ago that was, Jared, when, when Dan had done that narration uh, in that opener for the TV show, maybe in some of the early seasons of, of Whitetail Properties TV. But there was just like a uh, just a tone in your voice around that narration that really, I think, encapsulates... Um, kind of what anybody feels when you talk about land ownership and, and essentially being accountable and responsible for a, a piece of ground. My comment was just to your, you know, obviously genuine passion regarding land ownership and, and management and how contagious that is. Uh, you know, proof is in whitetail properties, but also the, the following that you guys have built, um, you know, along the way. And that's something that really struck a chord with, with me early on. Yes, sir. You know, what's interesting about what you just said is, um, so we've got, uh, I think right now we're up to 330, 30 something agents uh, across 38 states. And uh, I just said agents, but they're actually, they're land specialists. And, uh, you know, we don't sell, you never see us selling a laundromat in town and we don't sell houses in town or, or commercial properties either. Uh, it's what we sell what we're passionate about, what we respect, 
uh, what, what, what we live for. And the reason I could, when I say that, I can say it for every one of our agents is when we interview our agents, uh, there's three things that are, that are, that are paramount. One, they, they have to be honorable people. Um, two, they have to be passionate about land uh, and every aspect of the outdoors. And three, they, they have to be able to communicate on a professional level. Uh, we try not to hire from the real estate industry. Uh, even though you might get a really good uh, uh, real estate agent, it's, it's hard to uh, weed out the bad habits that have been taught to them by another broker sometimes, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, not always. We, we have hired some that, that aren't. But what I'm getting at is this. Uh, we, we've got 330 some odd agents out there who are fit the same DNA. All of us are, are passionate about land. And, and to your point, uh, it, it's infectious. Now, and I give you an example. Early on in my career, I was selling land and, and I was showing a piece of property. Uh, to, a, to a husband and wife uh, from Florida uh, and their kids. Uh, they had three kids and they had, they weren't really, um, they loved nature and they loved the outdoors. They loved to get out there and, and, and have picnics and Easter egg hunts and just enjoy their family and enjoy the, the outdoors and, and try the hunting aspect of it. You know, they like to fish, but they're into it, but they don't, uh, they don't necessarily have the same backgrounds maybe that, uh, that you guys and, and I have. Um, so while I'm showing them this property, uh, I look down in the mud and, and there's a five inch track, a big, a big old deer track. And I fell to one knee and, uh, I'm saying, my God, <laughs> look at the size of this track. And, and then the whole family, the three kids and the husband and wife, all of a sudden they're on their hands and knees with me and they're excited and they don't even know why. Yeah. And my, my, my point is, is it, it is infectious. It, it is, uh, it's not something that, uh, you could be a good salesman. Uh, you could have sold pharmaceuticals or, or what have you, and you, you're good at it. But in this business, uh, good is, is okay. But uh, if you want to be great, you've got to be passionate. And uh, all of our guys have the same DNA. Uh, we're represented um, as as though we cloned all of them. I mean, they all have different names, but when you read those profiles, you almost feel like you're reading about the same guy over and over and over. It's yep. not by accident. Yeah. Now, I think that's a good point. And I think what's really interesting about it, and obviously we'll, we'll get into kind of the evolution here, but you know, let's take current day land sales and, and especially, you know, kind of in it, but still post pandemic of, of COVID. You know, the amount of people that had lived historically in these cities and suburban areas that then had the opportunity and freedom per se to get away from that and embrace you know living on a on a piece of land or being in the outdoors and being a piece of land it it's i think i won't say that it's made it more difficult but it's interesting because of how dynamic that group of buyers now is versus you know, maybe pre COVID where it was, this guy is a serious hunter and he wants a piece of ground. He wants to invest. Now you're looking at probably again, like you said, Dan, early in your days with that family, those types of families again, who are saying, hey, listen, we don't have to live within the confines of this city. We could have a rural piece of ground in a lifestyle that is good for our entire family and, and feels, you know, good for everybody that's involved. That's, that's a fact. Uh, and, and that's true. I mean, the last two years, and I don't, I don't say this to beat our chest, and we're not all happy about COVID, and we're not happy about the lawlessness in the big cities. Uh, we're not happy about uh, political corruption. I mean, we're not happy about any of it uh, that's going on, but we have done very well as a result of it. Uh, speaking to what, uh, what you just said, um, there, there's mom, for example, she lives in Chicago. She's got kids and uh, she she loves the city life or felt she did till all this lawlessness has, has happened and, and the disease that is spreading uh, through just human contact. And there's tons of it up and down the sidewalks in the city all over the place. And, and she's she's got that uh, paternal instinct. She wants to get her kids and her family the heck out of that city. Mm -hmm. And so not only are there more uh, people moving to the country and uh, buying land and, and uh, but there's just, just moving to rural communities. I mean, there's so many people that are jettisoning the big cities. It's, it's unbelievable. I don't know what the numbers are now, but 
obviously that's that's helped our business greatly because it does, to your point, bring us a whole different um, group of buyers, large, large group of buyers that we don't experience on a regular basis. Now they're greater than that hardcore hunter, uh, that hardcore outdoors guy, you know, the wilderness dude. Uh, they're, they're much, much more of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, it has been it has been good to see them. And, you know, the other thing, too, that adds to that is all of this is going on and it's pushing people out of the city. Um, at the same time, technology is going on also, and more people are working for, from their homes. So, so that transition is much easier than it used to be. Right. Uh, and not, not to mention, there's another buyer that says, I'm not ready to leave my, my job with Dot Foods or uh, IBM or whatever major corporation in a big city. Uh, I'm not ready to leave them. I, financially, I can't. Uh, but they're still buying that property in, in the in the in the rural community or in the country um, to retire to. That's yep. become a big thing. More people want to retire to a safer place, one that they uh, can enjoy. Yeah, I, I feel very fortunate to have been exposed to it. Like as a kid, my my property or my my family and my grandparents before them have always owned property, and I've always had a place in the country that I could go and just you know, run, run wild, basically hunt and fish. And, uh, I started to realize pretty early on, like, uh, and it was living in the city in college that I think helped me make the distinction of like freedom in the country versus imprisonment in the city. And not, you know, not that there's anything inherently wrong with cities. You know, my wife and I own a business in the city and like, we spent a, a fair amount of time down there, <clears throat> but, I just don't have any other way to describe going out to these, the property that we own and spending all the time out there. They're just literally freedom. Like mm-hmm. I just feel a sense of freedom and that I, I don't know. I can't speak for everyone, but it seems like if, if everybody had a chance to experience that, like the pursuit for, for land ownership or like even just to get out of that city environment would be like, like even more rampant probably than it already is. Like there's just, to me, there's just nothing, nothing better. That sense of freedom of like owning this dirt that we're, mm-hmm. we're working. And it's like, I just, I get so much satisfaction out of that. And I, Dan, I can hear that in your voice too. Like even, I don't know you that well, but it's, it's obvious that, that you have that passion. And it's like, I just, I wish that everybody could, could get a taste of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it is awesome. My, uh, uh, if you don't mind me reminiscing, um, uh, I've known this since I was a kid that that land is what I want. My 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 dad, I mean, land has been the American dream for since the beginning of time. You know, mm-hmm. it's something that's in us. Um, it's the only only thing that that I could think of that uh, is it relieves uh, the everyday stresses. It puts you in a better uh, position to harvest game than any product that you could buy at. Uh, at Bass Pro, you know, it is, it is, but the, the cool thing about it is it's manufactured by God. It's not, uh, not something that you, uh, order on a- Amazon and they ship mm-hmm. from, uh, Taiwan, you know, I mean, it's, it's the real, it's the real thing. And so when we were very young, my wife and I got married young and, and, uh, uh, by the way, real estate is real estate. The first thing we did was, uh, first thing I did before I even got married, even though I lived at home, I bought a house. Uh, I was very serious about this gal and I bought a house. And uh, so even then I was thinking, man, I I don't want to make payments to someone Mm -hmm. who is taking my money and putting it in their bank and uh, they're growing wealth. And I'm I'm growing broke because now I'm still part of the inflation. He's going to raise my rent. You know, I'm not uh, I'm not gaining equity and or appreciation. Uh, so, so anyhow, I, I, that, that was a lesson that that house was a lesson because uh, I bought it for 23,000, somewhere in that range. Um, and it was a three bedroom, uh, a one bath house and in Tampa, Florida. Um, so I forget, I, I think it a few years later, le- less than four, some, somewhere in there, uh, we sold that house. Uh, for in the sixty thousand dollars, sixty three, sixty four thousand dollars, and uh, how else would a young kid uh, get a chunk of money like that uh, at, at that age? You know, just like boom, right. I got I got all this equity now. This goes into my next next house or that next piece of land. Uh, so it, it uh, 
The next piece, the next investment, by the way, was a house that we built, loved that house, stayed in it for a while, sold it, made a lot of money. Uh, but in the interim, uh, I bought, I think it was small acreage, I think it was around five acres. But uh, kind of what you mentioned about land, it, it, I mean, I'm, I'm driven by, by chasing critters, and, and, uh, but it's not about that. The reality is uh, I'm really passionate about um, the sun coming up in the morning and all of a sudden all, all, the, all the birds and the squirrels and everything is like waking up. The, 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 the woods are waking up. It's, it's an experience that it's almost spiritual, you know? Yeah. And uh, it, it's, it's the aspect of, of the outdoors and land and all that together. So we bought the first property that we bought. Now I'll, I'll dovetail a little bit into different ways to buy land. Uh, the first one that we bought was a few acres, a handful of acres. Uh, could you hunt it? Yeah, but you, you're not kill anything, you know, but uh, it was out in the country. Um, the area was Massark Town. It was just on, on, the, on the other side of, uh, of Inverness, Florida, and uh, it was all palmettos, pine trees. It was a pretty piece, and we, we just would go there, and we were in awe of the small acreage that we bought. Uh, we, we'd go have a picnic, we'd sit on the ground, uh, back to the tree and, and just sit there and listen to everything. And, and, and at that age, I'm like, man, I, I can't believe I own this place. Mm -hmm. Now I could believe I own a house and, and I, I could believe I own a car, but I couldn't believe I, I owned a piece of land, you know? And, and what's, what's interesting about that, it's, it's, uh, it got bigger from there. The land got bigger. Uh, although every time the land got bigger, I made more money, not only appreciate an appreciation, but I made money by different ways that that money, that property makes money. Right. But the first piece of property that I bought, uh, I bought it on a land contract, which, uh, is referred to as a contract for deed. The cool thing about that is, uh, I, I wasn't held. In other words, that's negotiable. You could go to a bank, and borrow money, and it would be based on uh, the Federal Reserve, what what it, where it is, what what the banks, uh, what their their deposits are. It'd be based on a lot of things. What the interest rate and the terms that they'll give you will be. They control them. You can't negotiate those rates for the most part. Uh, you might get a little better rate because you got better credit or whatever reason. Right. But uh, with a land contract, what's cool is you can negotiate the down payment and you can negotiate the rates, and they fit a lot of people. In this particular case, it was um, it was a older couple that was selling uh, this this property that I bought in Massark Town, and uh, they wanted steady income, you know, and uh, and they were earning the interest rate. Uh, so whatever I was paying them for the property, they were making an extra five percent, six percent on top of that, which I mean, that's good money you know, right. to make on top of your money. And the cool thing about a contract for deed, as far as the seller is concerned. Now, if you have doubts whether you're going to make the payment, then don't buy it on a contract for deed. You, mm -hmm. you because they could take it back very easily. It could be based on missing 60 days uh, to two payments. I, just, and I want to make sure it, I understand that. Uh, Dan, is does that, a land contract like that? Does that essentially just make the seller the bank? Is that how that works? Absolutely, the okay. seller the seller is the lender. So it's not sure. a lump sum. They just agreed you can pay me this x amount of money plus interest over a period of time, and if you don't make those payments, I can I can withdraw from the contract. You can foreclose on me. Got it. And everything I've paid you, you have, and right. I will get it back. So you're in a better equity position as the seller. Cool. Yep. But uh, what's cool as the buyer is I'm making that payment. And I, I didn't, in this particular case, it was Paul Meadows. I wasn't making any money, but I was getting the benefit of the appreciation. And it was a cool, there's a lot of things to look at when you're considering property. Uh, one, of course, people say location, 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 uh, where that property is located. And in this particular case, uh, Tampa, Florida uh, was growing mm -hmm. and the direction it was growing was out towards Inverness in that direction, right? Uh, busting at the seams, you know. And I, I, uh, I thought it'd be a, lo a good long-term investment because at point, some point, Tampa's going to be sitting in Massark Town, yep. Which was about it was about a forty-five minute drive at that time, which uh, we both know forty-five minutes for Tampa. 
uh, way back when to where it is now was nothing. Right. Uh, it, it just like boomed. Uh, so that was the location aspect of it. But the other aspect of it, uh, it is just, uh, God ain't making any more land. Right. It, it is the one product that you cannot duplicate. You can't keep building on it. You could take a big track and, and cut it into smaller pieces. Uh, and that, that, that helps you, you know, as far as creating more properties to sell, but at the end of the day, it's, you only have so much land surface across the country. So again, a few years later, um, there was another property I wanted. And, uh, so I talked to the, the landowner and, and, uh, I said, I, I want to sell this property. And, um, the, the people that bought it, so they, they got a, 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 just a regular loan and they cashed out the lender, uh, my, my, the person that's holding my contract for right. me and he was happy. He's cashed out. He's cashed he out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yet I sat on, I sat on uh, an equity chunk of money of about $60,000 that uh, while I'm enjoying this thing, I'm making money at a faster rate than what I'm paying the bank or paying him mm-hmm. interest, you know, at a, at a, a great, much greater rate. So that was awesome. Uh, contract for deed is, is, and you know, the thing about a contract for deed, you don't know unless you ask. Yeah. The, the person that's selling that land, they don't even know what it is. Right. And if, if you could walk them through it, and again, I'm, I'm not an attorney. Uh, I don't want at any point sound as though I specialize in lending or, or law or legal aspect of it, rather, of, uh, of land, uh, but recommend that they look into it. You know, if, if, if they're even the least bit interested in what you're saying, ask them to go to an attorney and make sure they're comfortable with it. Uh, but when you explain to them and, and then they learn more about it, that it's a steady payment, uh, they're earning interest and uh, they're in control because they still have the deed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might be surprised how many people will take you up on it. So, so Dan, like I'm currently making payments on what I know to be fairly similar, it sounds like it's just a promissory note. So I have an agreement with the seller who in this case is my father-in-law for a piece of property, you know, that has a business on it or whatever. Uh, it's, it would essentially, you know, be that, except I don't know that we have terms that he can, you know, pull it out from under me if I, if I don't make it. A promissory note is not as enforceable as a contract in, for in, deed, a, in a court basically. or, yeah, right, right. But I assume that's... Right, if you have nothing that he's attached, uh, he don't, he don't have the, the, the deed to your, to yeah. your. Yep. Bolt he already signed deed. it all over There's to nothing. you guys. Yep. I have yeah. it. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. it puts him in a more vulnerable position, which we were, you know, he yeah. was okay with because Family. of our circumstances, yeah. but. So uh, yeah. I guess Dan, you kind of, yeah, you kind of right. went into that a little bit um, in, in terms of how to approach, because again, I think it, you know, and I'm saying this from the perspective that I think a lot of people start looking at, you know, whether they're on the Whitetail Properties website or they drive by a sign or whatever, and they're like, man, I wish I could buy land, you know, and it's either 80 acres or it's it's 500 acres, whatever. You know, that discussion to start from, hey, listen, you don't have to go out there and qualify for a half a million dollar loan that you could p- essentially make a deal like a contract for deed Dude, is let's, very... Can, can we talk? Because I've, I've had a lot of questions about... I think you've run into issues regarding lending. And I know, yes. Dan, you're saying you're, you're not an, a, an expert, but yeah, we're going to treat you like you are. Uh, because of you, no structure. Yeah, you're saying that you've had issues getting, you know... In this very similar situation. So basically, I asked for a contract for deed for a piece of property I wanted to buy. The seller wasn't interested, which that's their right. Um, so I went to several banks. But they were willing to sell. Yeah, they down. were willing to sell. So I went to several banks for alone and I had 20% plus so like everything, but there was no structure on the property. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and the, the thing that I seem to run into Dan is that and most, the bank is looking for that as, cl- as collateral. They exact, want a structure on the property. Most traditional banks are, seem like they're not willing to, cause that's what the, appra- risk, uh, that's what the appraisal is based on in most cases. Correct. Yeah, risk for raw land basically is what they tell me. Yeah. So uh, there's two things, a uh, piece of raw land with no income, um, doesn't, doesn't interest this, the standard bank. Although there's, there's a lot of banks that, that are into, uh, a lot of banks and, uh, um, you know, like, uh, 
Compeer or Farm Credit or yeah, uh, like a credit union Rural type Thirst. thing. Yeah, those guys specialize in land. Sure, you know that's a whole a whole different thing, and with very very competitive rates and terms. But but there are some banks that do. You just got to learn which ones they are. But there is two. Even those guys that don't uh, they don't really invest in. Uh, they don't really loan on land. They will loan on a piece of land with income. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I, I, uh, I, I like Sorry, income for two, two reasons. Of course, it pays for the property, you know, and it's an easy argument when you're talking to your wife, uh, <laughs> uh, Babe, this thing land. is going to make us. Money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you do it right, you know, I mean, it, it is, it is literally the best investment that you can make. And, and the criteria, when you're looking at a piece of land, look at it from all the, all the buyer perspectives, for example, I mean, you might be buying it because it's like, man, there's there's booners running around on that property, uh, but it's got to have more if you want if it's a good investment. Uh, in my mind, uh, it has to have. Uh, can you can you build a house on it? Number mm-hmm. one, that's a, that's important. Can you build a house on it? Uh, uh, provide a good home site. Uh, can you can you run cattle on it? Can you grow crops on it? Does it have good timber on it? Is it accessible to power? You know, there's a lot lot of different factors that that because maybe one day uh, you're surrounded by by monster uh, civilization moves in. You know, big big stores and all kinds of stuff, and uh, that'll help you sell it anyway. But uh, the big deer part is gone. You know, yeah. if, you, if you bought it and it's, it's a lagoon uh, with good, good habitat, uh, that's not going to help you. So those things are important, but they're also important to a bank. Uh, the income part of it is a, is a big deal uh, because that helps them see where the money that's paying for this thing. Some of it is coming from besides what you earn where you work. You know, can I ask you, Dan, is it uh, as far as the bank is concerned, is it uh, in- income that the property is currently or has a history of generating or strictly that has the potential to do so. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you could, you could sell it on potential if you're really good at it, but uh, it helps that, uh, that you have, uh, data on the, mm-hmm. on, on, the on the soil and everything and the history uh, of the property as well. Do, do you have like a specific, um, like example you could, so like literally if we were to, to go to a credit union or something like this, do you know pretty much what they would ask for in terms of what, what, what what re- revenue is this property generating? Like, is, are there hunting leases on it? Is there a crop leasing happening on this? Is there ability for timber harvest? Are they asking those questions specifically? Uh, the ones that do lend uh, for rural property like that, that's very, those are very important questions. So when, uh, when we're buying a piece of property, um, I say myself or my partners are, are buying a piece of property. We ask for a due diligence period. And uh, the due diligence so- starts from when we sign that contract. And w- we want the certain things that we want from them. And we want the yields, if there's crop ground on it, we want the yields. And they, 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 if they have a farmer, the farmer has it or the FSA department has it. Right. Uh, we want to know uh, if there's any tenants, uh, how much time is on there on those leases, uh, any, any tenant whatsoever, hunting tenant or a farm trend tenant, all that kind of stuff. We, we want those contracts. We want to review those contracts. And we want to be able to take those contracts to the bank as yep. well. Um, all, all, everything that has to do, uh, depending on where it is, what kind of uh, property it is, maybe EPA test uh, we want to run. Uh, but we do, all the, we do all of our diligence uh, in a time frame, uh, I ask, I could, if they provide me all the information and the clock doesn't start ticking until they actually provide that information. Mm-hmm. When I have all the information and I sign off with them, that, that releases them of that. But the clock doesn't start ticking till I get all that stuff from them. And then uh, I could usually knock it out in 15 days. But depending on the size uh, of the investment and mm-hmm. the size of the property, I might ask for 30 days. Um, sure. We're we're trying to sell a property right now that the people have asked for ninety days. I don't I don't know what <laughs> I don't know what else. <laughs> or slow what movers. Yeah. Ninety days. Yeah, but, uh, that's a long time. Interesting. Yeah, because I you know so most of the ground that I'm looking at is in the eastern part of the country. There's some farm, but but most of it is timber ground. And so the the people that I've come across, at least Kentucky, yeah, like credit union people and things like that tend to say, well, if you get an official appraisal on the value of the timber on the ground, then that becomes a 
a valuable piece of collateral yep. to use for you know a loan. So, so, so what is Absolutely. what is the level of uh, ability to generate revenue or past revenue generated that these banks are looking for? They're like, okay, that's that's enough. Yeah, no, I don't know that they have a magic number. Uh, a lot of that will have to do with uh, uh, your ability to make the payments and uh, that the value of that property based on the payment, you know, because so uh, a, a piece of property isn't much different than, than a, a rental unit, you know, like you could you could uh, be looking at a rental uh, apartment, for example, and uh, so or condo, you buy that condo and it has a history of that condo uh, bringing in uh, 2000 a, a month or mm -hmm. whatever, that income is more important, almost more important than how nice that condo is, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. because it doesn't take long. I'll give you an example. Um, I've got a couple properties that uh, I bought them. They're, they're crop type ground that uh, not only did they cash flow, uh, but they paid themselves off. In other words, I, I want to know how many payments at, at that interest rate will it take to pay this property off based on the income. If I turned around and took all the income from that property and I put it right, that's that's uh, right back into the property and paying off the property. Mm -hmm. um, so I have one piece that I was getting a six and a half percent return that that uh, 10 years ago, it paid for itself. I forget, I didn't have it that long. I had it like eight years and it paid for itself. So now, I mean, calculate, you take the cash flow that I had that time, you compound it with, uh, that I'm getting 100% of that rent now. So that makes the return phenomenal. And if one day I sell it, that investment might represent a 90% re return. Where do you get that? You know what I right. mean? Yeah. Uh, what can you buy and get a 90% return that, yeah. of that, you know, a widget maybe uh, and sell it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Something like that. That's awesome. Dan, I want to go back just kind of as you reminisced earlier there, because I think this is really important and something that, you know, I know I've tried, uh, my kids are young still, they're five and nine, but uh, like as I grew up and, you know, it's no fault to my parents or, or, you know, if anything, I blame the schools, but like, you know, I come out of high school and get ready to go into college and like none of this stuff is taught. Like none of this understanding finances and, and how to, you know, invest. And, and even when you come out of college, I feel like unless you take the right courses, none of this stuff is taught. So I look at you as a young age in Tampa, Florida, like where did that spark come from to understand like, hey, if I buy this house and I'm doing it because I wanna win over the girl, right? But I buy this house and for 23,000 and at some point I can cash out at 60, like where where did that spark come from in your head to say I can invest and and continue to build you know investments off of this? Yeah, that's funny. I, I, I've uh, I've mentioned this story. I, I know when the light bulb came on. Uh, I was sitting on the Hillsborough River with my dad, and I thought the Hillsborough River was an amazing place. You know, uh, we were fishing, um, and where we were fishing is brackish water. Not that it matters to what I'm saying, but there were huge snook would come through there, mm -hmm. tarpon and it, uh, it was, uh, an awesome time in my life to be able to be fishing with my dad, you know? Yeah. So there, across the river, uh, there was a house and, uh, it had a, uh, it was on really nice mowed lawn and everything. And, and, uh, my dad said to me, um, he said when, I think it was when, when he was younger, it wasn't when he was a boy, but when he was younger, uh, he could buy that, that property on the Hillsborough river, uh, for like a few bucks, you know, I mean, like, like nothing, it wasn't like thousands, it's just a few bucks. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, uh, why, why didn't you, you know, I didn't, I yeah. didn't understand. And, uh, yeah, he grew up during the, the recession, the great recession. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a good good to grow up. Me growing up with a dad that grew up during the Great Recession because uh, uh, he was very very I mean beyond prudent. Uh, if if he went rabbit hunting and he took six bullets, there better be six headshot rabbits. You know, <laughs> uh, it, it's just that 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 was that it was not a joke. Yeah. And, and we didn't fish for fun. We fished for food. We right. didn't hunt for fun. We hunt for food. But uh, but anyhow, uh, that got my head like, what is it worth now, Pop? And, uh, and he tells me what the number is. And I'm like, 
oh my God. You know, I mean, it was like, boom, and just the light came on. And so I was always, always interested and I would gravitate to people who were investors, for example, or people that that did buy a house and 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 buy it for the purpose of selling it, mm-hmm. and uh, that was that always re- uh, interested me. And uh, the things that I read about had to do with people who were were wealthy, and every one of them uh, had a stake, in, a large stake in land. You right. know, I mean, it's it, it is, so it's it's a uh, it's a no brainer. I, I tell you, it, it I say a no brainer, but it's all a lot of it has to do with how you're wired. You know, we're not all, we're not all wired the same, thank God. Uh, and that's what makes it to where, uh, this, this world wouldn't exist if we were all wired the same. But, but since this, this gal wants to grow up and be a nurse, uh, that's awesome because one day she might be mending me, you know, mm-hmm. or this person wants to be an attorney. That's awesome because I hope I never need you. But, but if I do, you know, everybody's wired differently. I've always been wired, passionate about land and, interested in how to leverage that land, not only own it, but how to leverage it into, uh, uh, how, how to make it a better, provide a better life for my family. Yeah. It's crazy, man. <laughs> so what does that, what does that kind of look like now that it seems like the, the, you know, the value of land has kind of been realized and it's just, you know, it's rising across the country. It's like, is there still opportunity for people to get in low and, and sell high or to, you know, have these opportunities available to them? Yeah, that's cool that you say that. Over any 10 minute, I said 10 minute, any 10 year span, when you see land where it was the highest, within that 10 years, that land is going to exceed where it was, where it was the highest that you could possibly imagine. Yep. 10 years is a, is a pretty good prospectus period for about any investment. And the, the thing about it, it, it um, there's a, uh, we hear it often in this business, and, and it's, uh, I wish. I would have when I wish I would have bought that piece of property back when I could have got it for $600 an acre, you know, or I, I, and I wish I would have when it, it could have been 10 years ago, it could have been 30 years ago, or, or it could have been 10 minutes ago. You know what I mean? It doesn't, it'll always continue to appreciate in value. There's no, and, and so will, so will everything else. I mean, I wish that I could live on the, the small amount that my my dad's family, the kids and his wife were able to live on back then, but we can't, everything has gone up, right. but not as, not as consistently and, and not uh, as solidly as land has. It's the best, in my mind, it's the best investment you could have. I mean, now, I agree. Now what's been good for me, <laughs> what's been good for me is that deer, and I love deer, uh, and I'll tell you why in a, in a sec, but uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, they're an edge animal. Mm-hmm. They're not necessarily a, uh, a, a deep timber animal. Like, I mean, even though they, they inhabit deep timber, uh, they're, they're not a deep timber animal necessarily like a bear, for example. Right. Uh, although bear in the South and different places are knocking out cornfields. Or a moose. A, a moose is what I think of. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that edge here in the Midwest helps me a lot because I incorporate uh, my purchases with crop. Uh, I, I like my, my perfect world is um, a 60, 40 mix, 60% crops, 40% habitat. That that's my perfect world. And uh, as an edge, like I, I like to uh, me personally, I hunt uh, in the evenings. I like to hunt edge uh, in the mornings. I like to be in, in the timber. That's always been my, my deal there. Um, I don't like, uh, but but when that rut kicks up, of course, uh, I'm, I'm, I hunt evenings in, in the timber also because they're, they're bumping up does, but that's another story. But I love the edge because, for example, if if you could borrow money like right now, the, the, what you could borrow for is is uh, there's still loans that can be had for under 4%. That, that's just amazing. Uh, we should have been way higher right now, would have been if uh, if the world didn't go crazy. Yeah. Uh, we would have been higher. Yep. So what happens is when the interest rates go up, the land prices either hold or slip a little bit, you know, it's or, or vice versa. And, and so when the rates, rates go down, more people are buying. So the land prices go up a little bit. It's, 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 it's a give and take type thing. Uh, but uh, so if you can buy a piece of property where your interest rate is 4%, uh, but you can get a 
five percent, five and a half percent return on the investment, and that might be because your your cash rent uh, might be your cash rent and uh, a hunting lease. It might be any combination. If you could get there, or if it's three percent that you could borrow money and you could get a four percent, four and a half percent. See, be, all your all you worry about is uh, paying paying off. Will it handle? Will it reduce my my uh, uh, my principal. It's a reducing my principal. Right. Uh, the interest is what it is. So, so basically, you are cash flowing that property. Uh, it's it's and if you're cash flowing it and not doing anything else, if you're making five and a half percent on a four percent loan, you're making money. You're making money on that. But if you were just breaking even after your expenses and what have you, and what the rate is versus uh, how much more you're getting on your on your cash rent or your leases, uh, then then. Uh, your 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 the appreciation is what you're yep. you have there. If you can yep. just break even, you know, just like it don't cost you a penny. Once you put your down payment and you buy that property, it it costs you nothing. Uh, I mean that's that's incredible. Mm -hmm. But then you you add making money on the cash flow. You're making money, and that's not hard to do. Believe me, it's not hard to do. A lot of agents will tell you, no, no, you can't do that these days. But that's not true. That's the difference between a land specialist and a guy that's just a real estate agent. That re that land specialist can help you learn how to make money on that property. But then uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, not much different than my story as far as that first land contract. Boom. You you not only didn't it, it didn't cost you anything, but you made a ton of money. You know, yeah. it's it's uh, it's a solid investment. But the more the more you're exposed to it, the more more that you read about it, the more people that you talk to, the more podcasts like this that you engage in, uh, the more that you'll learn about it, you know, and, and it might take an investment or two. Uh, you know, you jump in there, it might take an investment or two where you don't make a ton of money. Sure. And uh, uh, but you learn. That's that's the whole thing. I'd, I'd rather learn about land, me personally, uh, than about something that's not going to help me be able to care for my family. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the difference in my mind. How, how common is it, Dan, to be able to, you know, because I hear you talking about like cash flow. So if I have a, if I have an interest rate of, of 4% and I'm, but I'm making, you know, five, five and a half percent, something that's exceeding that interest rate, how common is it to, to be able to achieve that in a relatively short period of time, like after expenses, taxes being, you know, the big one that I look at? Yeah, it just depends. You're not going to get every property that you look at. If you're looking at it from an investment standpoint, um, it, you, it's hard to do. You got to be careful not to fall in love too much with the property. <laughs> if your goal is to to be prudent in the purchase, you right? Know what I mean, uh, uh, so so you you may make offers on several pieces of property till you find that one that that does that, um, and it's not it's not. But it may come, I'll give you another example. You may buy it where you're not cash flowing because when you bought it, the, the crops were down. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the beans, uh, corn was only 250 a bushel, you know, right. but you buy it at that you, and, and you have a farmer. And then uh, when that contract's do, uh, done two years later, uh, now all of a sudden, not too different than what's going on right now. Uh, a bushel is five dollars. Now that changed the value of that property and changed your 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 rent. Yeah. Um, so that you that is another thing. And then the other thing to look at is how can I how can I improve this property to bring me the 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 highest yields, the the highest rent, uh, and uh, without destroying my habitat. You look for them pockets that you can turn into more tillable. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, I started off with on one property I've got here in Plainville. I, I, pro I started off with this much tillable and uh, over the years uh, have been able to increase it uh, by about uh, 10%. And that's a big property. So that's that's a, that's a big deal. Right. So you have to look at past that as well. What what can I do? And that's a that's that's a trained eye that you'll develop as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as far as the investment, I think just like any industry, the ability to spot those money making, you know, factors on a piece of land is ultimately what helps you, you know, know that it's a good investment versus not. Well, and I think you look at some of these things, like I, you know, I hear Dan kind of what you're saying there in the tillable ground and cash rent and stuff, whole different ball game when you get into some of these timber pieces that like where I'm at in Kentucky, I've got a couple properties I'm looking at that have significant white oak on them. And right now the bourbon barrel 
uh, manufacturing in Kentucky is like at an all-time high. The stave log value is is really substantial right now. Yeah. But to Dan's point, it's figuring out how to sustainably harvest that because, again, I'm a whitetail guy. I don't want to cut all my white oaks out. But also, how do I harvest those white oaks without also destroying, quote-unquote, my property? Sure. Yeah, good, good, good point. Uh, number one, the first thing I would do if I do have a good stand of timber – that represents a value. If I'm thinking about selling it at some point, um, I would get a timber cruise done. And that piece of paper, uh, when they finish that report and everything is very valuable. If you're selling, if you're selling a timber piece of property that does have a good stand of white oaks, um, that's that's very valuable. It, it, so you're out of pocket a little bit. You gotta, mm-hmm. you gotta be. Uh, a Unless lot of you know Forrester very well. <laughs> Yeah. Which I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah there you go. That's what I would do. The forester comes in and the forester will tell you, um, that's that's the first thing is is you want to engage your forester. If you're ever going to have timber cut, mm-hmm. you want to engage your forester because uh, his his goal is to keep that uh, that that stand reproducing right. uh, over the years, you know. And uh, so the cuts have to be smart. Do they open up more light for, for uh, future growth on these other ones that are too small? And then determining in that area what is too small. You know, mm-hmm. when, you, when you you measure its chest, chest high is is uh, what what is too small as far as the circumference for that area, um, that's a, that's a big deal. The the timber guy I'm not I'm not bad mouthing timber guys, but they're not all the same. Mm-hmm. Some of them want to cut everything they can, and some of them may want to cut much smaller than would allow you the continued harvest over the years. You know yeah. of those trees. Um, yeah, that makes sense, and I think that's where if you're. Uh, a balanced, if you're understanding it as an investment, you're understanding it as a piece of ground that you also want to balance to the management and the huntability side, you have that flexibility to say, well, listen, I don't need this money, right? So I don't need to come here and clear cut these 50 acres. I can be patient, yeah. wait for the market to respond or well, get it, somebody to selectively that's why cut. It's just, I think it's so important to be clear about yeah. your, your goals. You might say, listen, in- income, long-term income on this is, is my priority, but my very near second priority would be, you know, whitetail hunting is what yeah. I want to do with this property. Mm-hmm. And a lot of foresters that, that I've come in contact with, understand that Mm -hmm. yeah they know how to balance it dan i had a i got real lucky i think back in the day i was watching some they may have been whitetail properties videos or uh bill wanky midwest whitetail was a big inspiration for me when i was younger i remember watching some uh some videos about timber stand improvement and getting out with a chainsaw and the the driving point there is like consult a forester consult a forester yeah i'm like i don't know any foresters i'm like 20 20 years old you know and it's out of state. It's my parents' place to actually own this ground that we hunt here in eastern central Ohio. And uh, I reached out to uh, the state department or lo- local, uh, like Columbiana County, um, DNR or something like that. And uh, ultimately got connected with uh, a guy named Jed Coldwell, who is a forester for the state and has now become a, a great friend of mine, happened to live like 10 minutes down the road. Um, and so now I've got a, a great forester who's a, a good friend of mine and also, pocket. and a big deer hunter too. Yeah. That lives right down the road from me. So I, I kind of lucked out in that, mm-hmm. that, that it endeavor. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, what they miss sometimes is that, uh, cutting the timber, uh, actually in most cases improves your habitat. Yeah. For sure. Tail. You know, so that's a difficult that's a, concept that's a for not non-conservatorially minded people to understand well a cutting a tree yeah. is um and, uh, and i'll give you a good example when i bought my first piece of ground here in pennsylvania i can like distinctly remember um like nailing or stapling the posted sign on an oak tree that was like hey this is like my tree now <laughs> yeah right and it's such a weird mindset like people don't understand that because i mean i've been on properties i've had permission but like when it's your tree and i have that even now in kentucky like even though timber prices are decent, I've got some giant red oaks and I had a forester come out and he's like, well, you know, you get about 60 some cents per board foot on that. And I'm like, I'm not cutting this tree for that. Cause it's just, it's a, you know, 70 or 80 year old red oak. And it's like, I can't cut like the money and emotion. And that's the hard part, probably to Dan's point of like, can't get too attached to a property if you're looking to make this an investment. But there's certain things where I'm like, there's no way I like I can't cut that well, tree at, because at of a money of reason. Day, not yeah, not everything has to be about profit. Sure, I, I'm sure you know Dan understands that. Yeah, as well as any, but yeah, there's some things you just can't. Yeah, you just can't part. It sounds with. crazy, but people like I told somebody that the other day. I was like, yeah, I'm looking at this, this giant red oak, and they told me what it was worth, and I was like, yeah, there's no way I'd ever cut that. And like they looked at me funny, and I'm like, like 
But you it's know, just emotional different. There's an important, there's an important uh, comment there about you know money is not everything just sure. in life and even in regards to like an investment is land and it's like a, a lot of the return that you can get from that is maybe more spiritual than financial. Yeah, I agree with that. Hundred percent, hundred percent. If I uh, have people laugh at me sometimes, if I'm buying a piece of property, I mean I could put a pencil to it, but. Uh, I actually go, I ask the landowner or, or the agent, um, most of the, my dealings are, are through our own agents. Uh, if, if I could hang out on the property and I might go out there and, and just sit on a log, man, and just experience the property, just feel it. I got to feel it. it. It's uh it is, uh, it, it is, it is spiritual. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I got a cool, um, chief Seattle, uh, Indian from way back, uh, wrote this, he wrote this big letter to uh, one of the presidents and it had to do with, you know, you, you want to take our land and what you don't understand is that the, uh, the streams that run through our land uh, represent the, the blood of our, our forefathers and the, and the trees, you know, it was, it was like the most eloquently written letter I've ever read is, is huge. I've got, mm -hmm. I've got it framed and it was uh he talks about all this. So, so, and he's saying, how can you, how can you take this? It, it is, it, it is everybody's. It was, you know, and, and he says, uh, and he says, and I am, people say I am, we are savages yet, you know, and he's, and, and what, what's cool is that he's, he's kind of reflecting that people call him a savage yet that letter was written as well as anything that I've ever read in my life. You know, right. It was really, really good. You could feel it. But uh, to your point, uh, I've got a uh, I've got a piece in, in Missouri over there that uh, I've got this barn that is really, really old. Uh, it's uh, the pegs. They use wooden pegs, dials mm -hmm. instead of nails back then. Yeah. You know? And uh, and the bones of the, of the barn, I mean, the structure, the internal structure of the barn is as uh, as strong now as it was uh, over 100 years, 100, probably close to 200 years ago that it was built. Uh, just as just as strong, and, and it's weathered, no no doubt. But it's costing me money because it interrupts. It's right in the middle of a cornfield, and it interrupts the uh, yeah. the the tractor, the, the 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 natural rows, you know. Yeah. And uh, but I'm not. That's staying on the property because <laughs> it, it's. I feel it. It's, yeah. I, yeah. I, I love that thing, just like that that tree. You know, I I can relate to that. That's why I like to, if I'm going to cut timber, uh, go through that property with the forester and flag the ones that I'm willing to sell. Right. Know? And so. No, I yeah, think that's I, a good I know point. Exactly what you're saying. Uh, you mentioned the name. How, how could we find that uh, that letter? Chief Seattle. Chief Seattle. Yeah. Little. If you Google, uh, can you Google the Chief Seattle letter? Uh, just any combination of Chief Seattle. Just and see if letter, you can find it for after. Uh, yeah, cool. you, you you'll get it. Cool, Dan. I, I think you you brought up a good point when we were talking that and and kind of tying into the whole Chief Seattle. There is you know, and especially for our hunting community, there are certain people and, and groups of hunters in this community that feel the way that privatization of the land has basically been detrimental, right? In that, and a lot of it is, you know, people saying, well, I used to hunt that for 20 years and, and now so-and-so bought it or so-and-so leased this. And, you know, it's the access complaint. And, and that's I a re that's a recent complaint. My, very much my, so. My uncle who, you know, Dan probably is your age is that's like his go-to conversation is he's like, man, when I was your age, my age, now I'm 28. He's yeah. like, I, I used to hunt every property. Yeah. He's like, nobody cared. He's like, I could hunt everybody's and, property. And frankly, I just had a big run in on a piece of ground that I likely will purchase here at some point yeah. in Kentucky that I, I leased interimly. And, and frankly, the people needed the money. Um, and the neighbors who I have, I've been nothing but great with and friends with basically were very upset that I leased this property because they wanted to hunt it. And it was one of them was actually trespassing on it, so he was hunting it. But the the bottom line is, is it's a, it's such an emotional thing when you talk about land. But I guess what do you guys as White Hill Properties and Dan, even your personal mindset, when you hear things about you know essentially people being angry that like this privatization is quote not good. Yeah, it's it's you know it's it's always existed mm -hmm. uh, since the beginning of the time. I mean. It, People own land. It's just the, the way it's always been. 
I, I, uh, I grew up uh, where we hunted wildlife management areas. And uh, for example, even here in the Midwest, there's plenty of wildlife management areas, Ted Shanks right across the river. Uh, they're, they're, they're all over the place. If someone would sit there and, and for example, here on the Mississippi also, there's, there's uh, anything that's uh, from the water, from between the water and the levee that's, uh, that's owned by the state. Uh, you could hunt it. There's things that you can hunt without having to cross onto your neighbor's property. Mm -hmm. uh, there's tons. Uh, there's actually thousands and thousands of acres of public land. We were on some and of that I enjoyed it in July. Yeah, yeah. I, I grew up hunting public land and I loved it. Uh, what's cool is because uh, we didn't, we couldn't leave a stand, uh, so we got really good at hanging stands. And, and we couldn't, uh, you go in there and you scout fresh sign, whatever's happening right now, you don't have history on anything. We didn't have, there weren't no, there weren't any uh, cameras, mm -hmm. uh, mobile cameras out there <laughs> back then. So you had to learn, uh, you had to get really good at, at, at reading sign. Uh, how fresh is it? Why are they using it? You had to key on what was like, for example, you had, I knew, and down in Florida, I knew when the persimmons came in and where the best persimmon patches were. Yeah. I knew when the palmetto berries uh, were in season uh, and, and where's the best place to, that had palmetto berries and trees to hang stands. Uh, all, all, whatever, all the vegetation that was edible, uh, I, I knew the highest, the best time, scrub oak acorns. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but there's, yep. there's scrub oaks. That, they're not much more than sometimes waist high, sometimes chest high. But they'll put out an acorn as big as some of our big white oak acorn, acorns here in the Midwest. I knew where, I mean, I had a place, uh, Bull Creek. It's a wildlife management area. It's kind of cool. I, uh, I was a kid. Uh, I said kid. I was 18. I was old enough to drive. But uh, I didn't have, all my arrows weren't perfectly spined. <laughs> I had all kinds of arrows. I might, take, I might take 30, 40, 50 arrows with me. And uh, I had, uh, believe it or not, I had a palm tree in Bull Creek, just a palm tree. Uh, but I knew it was a hot spot because uh, this one flat of scrub oak acorns, every one of them uh, the year before was laying on the ground. The hogs would come up to them and they put, they press their chest and just walk them down to the ground and eat all the acorns. So I came back just early enough, uh, when that whole craziness started. And, uh, in the course of a morning sitting on that palm tree, uh, I don't know how many hogs I shot. I had blood trails going in every direction, <laughs> uh, and, and, <laughs> and killed two deer as well. We could tag, to, uh, without a tag, we could take two deer a day in, back then in Florida. And of course, all the hogs that you could. And, and uh, I just, I would be real, real careful. So when I shot and I hit them, I, I watched, I watched those scrub oak acorns busting, you know, when they stopped, mm -hmm. I knew that's where he stopped. Uh, so it, it uh, did I ever lose animals? Yeah, I probably lost a couple of hogs here and there that I didn't even know that I shot. Uh, but but uh, it was it was a lot of fun. But my point is, um, there's a lot, there's thousands of acres, and and if you if you really if you really scout them and and you learn the, those properties, you could be just as successful as uh, and have much more to hunt than than a guy that only home, owns a hundred acres. You know. Yeah. And so, I think that's kind of been at least one in leasing. And then even in my land purchases recently, like my place in Kentucky is bordered by Daniel Boone National Forest, which is hundreds of thousands of public land acres. And frankly, where my land touches it, it's like three or four miles from the nearest access point. So literally I've got great hunting on the public side because nobody can get to it. Yes. That's awesome. That is awesome. But you know, and the flip side is this, like, like I value my land the same as my house. If you, if you trespass on me, like, I don't know what that person who wants to hunt on me, I don't know what he does uh, on weekends. I don't know what he, what he does, how hard he works at what he does and, and what his passion and his goal is. But I, I know that I've invested a great portion in my life to be able to own right. a piece of land. Now, when you, when you trespass on me, you might as well be in my living room. There's no difference <laughs> in my mind. If you're in my house, which I, I worked very hard to have, you know, it, it, or my land is there's no, I know there's the no difference. There's got to be a reward in my mind. If that's what you're the way that you're wired, like, like, uh, and I, I'm, I'm a general sportsman, but, but I'm very passionate about the land aspect, aspect of it. The reason I say general sportsman, I like it all. I mean, I like hunting arrowheads. I, I, I like fishing. I like, uh, uh 
I like every aspect of, of the outdoors, but uh, owning land, um, it doesn't come by accident. You, mm-hmm. You've got to work at it. I had, and, and the flip side is this, I had like a kid, for example, was saying all kinds of bad things about whitetail properties. We sold his grandmother's property and uh, now he has no place to hunt because these people are on their hunting. You know, I've heard that flip side of the story. Now his, his grandmother, uh, God bless her, she, she was uh, 80 something years old and she was a greeter at Walmart. You know, she didn't want to be at Walmart standing on her feet every day, you know, and uh, she needed to sell that property so that uh, she could enjoy the remainder of her life. So this this kid, I actually I actually uh, came up to him and I, and I said, listen, let me tell you about your grandma, what you may not know. And I, and I told him about, you know, don't be mad at her. You know, he's mad at her. Don't be mad at us. You know, if you ever need to hire uh, uh, someone to sell a piece of property that one day you might have, you'll know we're effective. You know, we'll do a good job for you. But consider the fact that now your your grandmother is able to retire and you're all mad because you got this free opportunity to hunt since you were a little little baby, you know. So maybe it'll inspire you to work towards something, you know. I don't know. It, It touched me in a way, a side of the fence that a lot of people don't look at. Uh, as far as land ownership. Well, I think it goes back to kind of, it's how Jared and I think it's I, a lot of people that I know think this way. And, and it goes back to kind of your early days of how you got into the land uh, purchasing side and ownership side. But, you know, it, and I, it's not to say like I, I hunted by permission when I grew up and I had access to different places, but, but there's a different understanding of when you have to literally, you know, claw tooth and to earn and to own something versus like you just have access to it and um you know i think that like even in your case with your farm like your parents worked really hard to have that farm thus you have the opportunity to have it and i think that when you get to some of these people who are simply like well and i know plenty of the places where it's like yeah i hunted up for 20 years like i can't believe i can't hunt that anymore because it's sold it's like well like you should have been working so hard to buy it Frankly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What you take casually, I, I, I invested my whole life to, to have. So, and I'll tell you this. So there's a Buckhorn uh, Wildlife Management Area, just not too far from here. A lot of the guys here in the office go, it is as good as any piece of property. It, it's, it's a wildlife management area, but it's as good as any piece of property you could wish for to hunt. Uh, there's a place down the road here, not too far on the Mississippi called Rip Rap, and it's public land. Uh, state's not making any money on that. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm helping pay for that, you know, taxpayers. Uh, and, and so riprap, if tomorrow I didn't have uh, any place to hunt and I went down there and I, and I scouted riprap and I hung my stands and I did my, my diligence, uh, I have no doubt in my mind, I'd be knocking down really, really good animals at riprap or buckhorn or uh, I'm forgetting another one within a short, short distance of here. But if people do the research, mm-hmm. there's a there's public ground within a reasonable drive of where they live. Uh, and well, it's, it's, yeah, we talked about it earlier, Dan. In fact, the, the place that we got a booner just the other day is Shawnee National Forest, which is southern Illinois. Oh, yeah. You know, and, yeah. and yes, we That's have... It's really close to that uh, that buffer that you're talking yeah, about we have between a, the river and the, and the levee. We have a small lease there, but this deer is on public. Like, that we access through our lease. So, I mean, yeah, I I think to the, I think it comes back to, and it's again, no knock to these guys, but it's the, the ease of things, right? Cause frankly, if you want to hunt public, you got to work hard for it. You got to understand how to read side versus, Oh, you know, I've hunted this farm for 20 years and I've got this stand, whatever permanently built in this tree. And I just go to it every day. And eventually, you know, I get lucky. Yeah. You, 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 you nailed it. That's Shawnee. When I was, um, so uh, I was with PSC for, for several years, and uh, I was a rep. I covered uh, Illinois, uh, Missouri, and Iowa for them. So I spent time around the Shawnee. I had several accounts down there. And some of the, some of the heads in the, in the pro shops, when I'd go in there, some of the deer that were enormous in there came out of the Shawnee National Forest. Yep. Just blow your mind uh, how big they were. <laughs> That's what blew our mind. It, it's like a, it's a 175-inch nine-point. Mm-hmm. what he is basically nice. yeah, yeah. He's, he's giant just living in the mountains you know or the hills he's a giant mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I think to you know the feelings of butthurtness i guess or entitlement to to, to land is you know i don't get mad at those people i think just like the, the it's a harsh reality that like land is a 
a limited resource, you know, and it is becoming more privatized. And, you know, while I, I want everybody to be able to experience, even if it came easily to them, um, you know, just being able to hunt a good piece of ground. But the reality is that there are people who, you know, have a, a burning interest or passion to, to, to own that opportunity, you know, and that's kind of constantly lurking for the people who are just soaking up the benefits that, you know, they've enjoyed up until this point. To, to Dan's trespass point and even to that young man and his grandma's property. Sold, uh, dude, I can relate to that a lot. Well, and I sympathize with it. In fact, there's been plenty of times where I've got access or I leased a piece of property or I bought ground that I encountered a trespasser who then kind of told me the story. And I almost want to be like, dude, if you would have just came to me without trespassing, like, maybe I would have let you take your kid and, and shoot a doe. Yeah. Like if that's really what you wanted to do, well, come and, talk to me. Instead, you just trespassed and you blew it. Acting, like it's over. Acting on entitlement yeah. is, is not, you know, rarely the right response, you know. And, and you're not always going to get people who are compassionate um, you know, or able to extend that compassion or, or whatever. But um, Yeah, but the worst act, they're going to say is no. Right. Acting out of entitlement is, is rarely going to get you the response that you want. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And what you said about uh, the population increasing, it may seem like it's more um, uh, more prevalent these days as far as land ownership, taking people um, out of the places that they used to hunt, you know, uh, but it's, it's, it's no different. It's at the same rate as the population is growing. It was a really good point because yeah. uh, land ownership, staking a claim on a piece of ground the american dream has always been land ownership right and uh and there was wars over land ownership there's still wars over land ownership but uh, you know people trying to steal claim uh, uh, uh people's property and stuff that they staked the claim to way back when uh, it just it hasn't changed there's just more people involved 100 percent. well and i think that is the the kind of odd thing about the argument when they say, well, you know, I don't have access, you know, this is now private and stuff. And it's like, it like America's always been a land grab, like always. That's, that's, that's the right. entire point of this country. If, you know, w- whether it was the colonies to, well, the difference, claim the difference in the West. is like, there's always been enough, you know, and sure. not that there isn't enough now. It seems like it, it's the, the value, the growing population is what's fueling that, that pressure, you know, or Listen, there are still plenty. I won't give them away because I'm still trying to buy them, but <laughs> there are still plenty of gem properties out there for like a price that would blow people's minds. But you just you got to work for it. You got to do your right. research, you, you know, and in fact, some of the best properties that I've found for sale weren't for sale until you talk to them, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and that just happens to be how it is. Well, and we're just a, a niche here, too. I mean, Dan knows as well as anybody, you know, the, the deer hunting niche, which is one of the major major driving factors of what we're looking for out of land is just a small percentage of what potential buyers are looking for. You know, a lot of people are just looking for remoteness, you know, b- yes. beauty, ability to do whatever they want to do out there. You know, deer hunting is probably just a, a fraction of, yep. of it. That's, that's, that's true. We have, uh, I've always had more people that weren't hardcore anything, but uh, their dream was uh, that place uh, on the hill, that little cabin mm-hmm. or house on the hill, looking down uh, at, a, at a pond or a lake, uh, someplace where the family can gather and they can walk the woods uh, with their grandson. Uh, that's that's kind of like the American dream, you know? You know what he's talking um, about? Yeah. My dad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah that's, and that's very common. And, you know, a lot of people never get to uh, realize that dream. It's funny that way because uh, – They'll come down from Chicago, for example, here to the Midwest. It's not too far of a drive, um, but Chicago's in the Midwest. I mean, to the country. And uh, that's what they express that they want. But between the time that they retire and they, they had this land, a large percentage of them will sell it. But the, the good thing is they made money, you know? Sure. But, and they had that dream, and, and, and it's changed for whatever reason. Things happen. Well, I think but, uh, that's that's the American dream. I think to your point too, Dan, and, and kind of not to keep driving back to that reminiscent point, but you know, and I found myself in this position when I first started looking to buy a piece of ground is I think I always in the back of my mind just kept looking for the perfect piece. And frankly, it doesn't exist or rarely does exist. And if it does exist, somebody probably owns it and doesn't want to sell it. But what happens is I think people get in that mind, like, oh, I'm just looking for this piece. And frankly, time's precious and it eventually slips away and you don't buy anything or you don't invest into anything. 
And so I think yeah. to your point, you know, maybe you find a piece of ground like that small acreage in Florida that's palmettos and palms. But eventually it's like, hey, this is the stepping stone to the next piece, to the next piece, which maybe eventually hits me to my, quote, forever home or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't hurt you necessarily if, if that's the case, because uh, if you're smart in your purchases, you're, mo- you're making money along the way. Mm-hmm. And each one of those p- gives you a little more of a nest egg to, to be able to apply to that, that better property, that bigger property. But I'll mention this. Uh, if you follow this analogy. Uh, when you're when you're looking at, at a house, sometimes uh, you're you're depending on your willingness to invest yourself and invest money. Uh, you you may be wise to not buy the most expensive house in a really nice community, but try to find that that house that uh, needs something uh, in that real nice community because it's about the community in in. in so when I say that, so if all the houses around you were half a million dollars and you bought this one for two, 200,000 uh, and, and you did what it needed to, but did it prudently, uh, you just turned it into a half a million dollar house because you're in a half a million dollar neighborhood. Right. Now, if you've got a million dollar house uh, in a uh, $200,000 neighborhood, you've lost a lot of money, mm-hmm. you know? So, so what I'm getting at is this. If it's whitetail land, and I'm talking whitetail land with you guys because you're two whitetail guys, yep. and a lot of your listeners are, are whitetail guys or viewers or whitetail people. Uh, so uh, the wise investment is that 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 piece of coal that isn't quite a diamond, but if it's in a community of, of diamonds, if you could buy that property and improve the habitat, and there's no ab- habitat that you cannot improve. And, and what, what I mean by that, you, you could add cover. Uh, you you could add water if it needs water. You could add food. You could do all these things. Uh, but the prospectus are those trail cam picks. When you start getting those trail cam picks of so those beasts that are already in the community, you've just given them a reason to come to your property. Uh, and you could get uh, uh, those 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 trophy shots with you holding that animal, uh, that beastly animal. Uh, you just brought that property, uh, whatever you bought it for, you've just probably doubled it in a lot of cases. So I love those pieces of coal. When I'm Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I'm more interested in what can I do? Two things to, to, in my mindset is what can I do to improve this property as far as income? You know, if I'm, if I buy it and it's a 2% return, uh, uh, how, how, how can I make it a 4% return? How right. can I make it a 5% return? And, and if I could buy that piece of property and it's a, um, uh, uh, just an average whitetail property. What can I? How can I make it a mega buck type property, mm-hmm. big buck acres? And that's uh, that's where again uh, I call that forced appreciation. So you could invest your money in a paper investment. And some people who are are, are, are stockbrokers hate to hear me say stuff like this, but you can invest that. And you could count on it that you've got a good broker. Uh, uh, but from there, you let it go. You could you could cross your fingers till they're like the tips of them are white. And uh, you're not going to change the value of that stock one bit. Uh, however, with a piece of land, something is, 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 may seem as insignificant as a, uh, a gate, a, fr- a brand new gate and fresh fence or uh, improving the road network that's on the property or uh, putting in some lush food plots. Or it may, maybe if you're in an area where... Uh, you got to have a place to stay because you're so far from the next city uh, that you you build a, a, a little facility there that looks nice. You know, uh, my, my partner, Peter Fano, could could build uh, and he's done it. He's taken pieces of property and he's built the most beautiful uh, metal building type yep. uh, uh, houses uh, for, with texture, they, with tile floors that are that are designed, uh, but they're printed, uh, concrete floors that are mm-hmm. printed that look like tile, uh, just beautiful for almost nothing, you know, in, in relationship. In my mind, and this varies with the region, where you are in Texas, uh, it may not be the case. For example, parts of South Texas, big lodges, expensive lodges are a big thing. Parts of Oklahoma, parts of Kansas, that's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a big property seller. But as a rule, uh, when I look at a piece of property, that property uh, has to be somewhere in the range of less than 20% of the total value of the property. 
any more than that, now I'm selling a house and I'm not not necessarily the property. The, That's a good sale, point. Yeah. Yeah. The sale has to be about the property. That house will fall apart over time. That property will, will keep reproducing itself. And with your help, it'll, it'll do it better every cycle. The, yeah. the one that's like, so, you know, it seems like may have the one of the biggest impacts of all of these, but uh, a potential buyer has maybe the, the least ability to put a finger down on is uh, neighbors. Sure. I feel like if, and I'm sure you guys have had discussions about this at, at Whitetail Properties, but it's like, man, if somebody could, could forecast or understand or assign value to a property based on the, the bordering neighbors, like, uh, you know, what a, what a better understanding of what the property is capable of. Well, and I think of. that's where Dan's saying this whole, you know, this well, is a piece almost of coal more, with more than diamond the timber that's the on rust. the property, more than the yeah. food plots you can put on it. All those things are great, but almost a mute point if your neighbors aren't well, on the same page. And I think I've seen to, to Dan's point and it's still rough properties, but I've seen properties or you want to invest in a fence. Yeah. <laughs> over, overpriced for the area. Right. And so if you look at what you could do effort wise to them, you could still make a return on those properties. But frankly, in the, in the neighborhood that they're in, yeah, but who knows? there's no value. I mean, you could go to, to a part, you know, guys will tell you, you go to a part of Iowa. It's like, it doesn't matter where you go. There's going to be big deer there. If you have neighbors that are willing to pass on those sure. two, three, four year olds. And the value of the land probably is And there's no way to know that. There's that. not like a database of like, oh, okay, these neighbors are all, their mindset is this. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist. Yeah, neighbors can ruin everything mm -hmm. or yeah. make it. Don't, don't, don't ever let them change your mentality though. If, if I've heard people that their goal is to uh, uh, hold and grow uh, mature animals, five years old, six years old, and uh, but they develop the attitude. Uh, why? Why should I bother? My neighbors shoot everything. Don't ever develop that attitude because then you just you're, you're hurting your investment and uh, you you lost the meaning of why you bought the property. I say that only if that's the reason you bought the property. Sure. So so in in saying that the goal uh, is to make okay. Let's say there it's said that they're their core is two miles, whatever, half a mile and a half to three miles, whatever it is. Um, do everything that you can on that property to make that the core, the core of their core. And uh, what I mean by that is so that they spend the greatest amount of daylight hours on your property. It reduces the chances of of your neighbors harvesting them. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, landowners that have large pieces of property, they kill, they can kill tons of does and they make, they make it a mission to kill tons of does. So the bucks continue to, to move. They move more. If the ratio is in, intact, they move more looking for receptive does. Right. And uh, so, but if there's a million does, this buck could stay there in that one area forever and uh, not, not give you a crack at other stands that might provide better wind directions and so on. But if, if you've got the best habitat, that, that keeps them uh, on your property the greatest number of daylight hours, you reduce the, the chances of them harvesting those animals, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so, so, but, but don't, don't, don't switch and say, well, why bother? If, if that is your reason, because when you have that prospectus, uh, you, you, you'll sell that property for more than any of your neighbors could sell properties. I, I sold, I've sold properties that the, the, the neighboring properties uh, historically, uh, we're say, for example, $1,500 an acre. Uh, and I've gotten as much as $3,600 an acre for a property with big bucks on it. And the reason is, uh, is because that animal truly represents that history of animals, uh, truly represents a value to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And, and, and some folks might say, well, I, I can reproduce, that and just buy another property in the neighborhood and re reproduce that that's pro pro probably true if the property is as big and everything but uh so i one guy said it best he said listen i i don't have 15 years that i want to invest in getting a farm up to where they have already gotten it right uh, and, and so i'm willing to pay the extra money and uh, and come up with a better investment than they would have had otherwise if they'd have put all those years into trying to produce a farm that held 200 inch class animals. 
what I was getting at a second ago was this. So these guys that have a lot, a lot of acres and kill a lot, a lot of does, uh, that's wonderful. They're managing, they actually have enough ground to manage. Now, if you have 80 acres, uh, you don't have enough ground to manage does because when you harvest those does and they're dead, they're gone. The, I mean, your, your farm, if it's a rectangle, probably is no more than a uh, uh, quarter of an acre wide. You know, if it, so, so you've got neighbors really close to you that you they will take, they will be replaced by the does next door. Right. Uh, and the reason I mention that is those does become very attractive, uh, when when the rut kicks in they, they uh or the pre-rut kicks in and I mean, yep. they become very attractive don't wipe out your does i uh, just wanted there's a, there's a misnomer there that that you just kill does just just to just make sure if you got a lot of does that you're seeing just kill them all and you'll see more bucks <clears throat> not true <clears throat> on a small piece of property and you probably make i would assume if you start killing those does especially during the you know uh, pre-rut into the rut you're probably forcing those bucks to get on their feet more and if you only own 80 acres they're going to be on your neighbor's property moving just as much as they should be or on more. your property yeah yeah <laughs> or, or more yeah so so yeah so to to uh, to what you're saying if you've got all, all if that's the core of their core in other words you've got the habitat uh you you've got uh, you've got the food and you've got the women mm -hmm. uh they're coming i mean there's, there's just this and, and it doesn't even have to be you don't <clears throat> you don't even have to be this scholar uh, of of reading sign mm -hmm. sign. You you just hunt the does and, and you'll be hunting bucks. If we hear got that a lot, huh? <laughs> hunt the yeah. does. Yeah, that's a big. Not that I want to go all the way down this rabbit hole, but the, the doe discussion and and how many to harvest is a big unanswered question for me. It just seems like there are so many. Uh, Th thoughts or beliefs on the correct way to do that and it's across the board damn my family owns a, th a thousand acres in eastern central ohio i mean it it's big enough to have to have some kind of an impact on on a herd yeah um, absolutely and you know there's been years that i've seen uh, a lot of does and there's been years that it doesn't seem like there is a lot and i i don't have uh you know a, a real st strict observation of like what buck movement or what rut hunting was like in relation to mm -hmm. the amount of does that we were harvested and, and i'm at a point truly to where i don't i don't know <laughs> yeah we try to shoot some does because it seems like there's a lot you should yeah. you know at, at least as many bucks as we shoot i'm like man i try to shoot as many does as we do bucks i don't know if that's right or or not mm -hmm. yeah yeah if if uh if um uh, if you leave it to mother nature uh the coyotes can't keep up with the does and uh if you leave it to mother nature if you have a thousand acres or more, whatever, the Amish can though. <laughs> and if, if, if you if you don't take care of balancing the herd, um, Mother Nature will, in some form of a disease or something, they 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 will ba balance the population. And if the greatest number of deer on the property that they're balancing, or the area that they're balancing is is a doe ratio of maybe eight to one or whatever, uh, the does it'll impact the does more than the, it will. Mm -hmm. bucks. My comment there, Dan, was the the coyotes might not be able to, but the Amish sure can. <laughs> <laughs> Which and that's goes yeah. back to the neighbor comment is like we, we don't know, you know, and yeah. uh, you know I, I have no problem with my neighbors, several of which are Amish, shooting does or bucks. It's their property; they shoot whatever they want to shoot. But I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I don't know how many they're, the they're killing. And we try, yeah, we try to communicate, and they're like, oh yeah you know, 26 or so. <laughs> We're like, wait, what? <laughs> They're like, oh no, like actually like four. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's hard to know how many are shot versus are recovered. It's just a, it's a very difficult thing to, to, to actually know. Mm -hmm. And so I just have a hard time assigning any kind of prescription to tell my guys, Hey, we got to shoot. I think it's just observation and kind of what you see over time. And, and frankly, you have enough food. If anything, yours is a limiting factor is cover. Um, and so, you know, at some point, I think observationally and being in the woods, you'll see like, you know, I got too many does like this field's loaded. Well, I, there's even too that many. is so hard to know because those deer are resourceful. They'll, you know, during the month of November, I, I might see on average one or two does a hunt, you know, but come the late season, those deer know that I've got the food. And so I might see 30 does in a field. Mm -hmm. Does that mean yeah. I have too many does? Maybe at that time. Yeah in relation to the amount of food, but I don't, I, I don't know. I've, I've yet to, I've heard a lot of good methodologies. It doesn't, there's no blueprint. There's it's no per property. 
per situation and, and what your goals are. If your goals are just to kill a deer, then have as many as you can possibly have. If well, it's, it's not. It's to kill a giant box. Yeah. And as many of them as possible. Yeah. So, you may not need to kill So, any. what do you think? Do I get to kill those or no? No. <laughs> no? I don't think you do. What do you think, Dan? Uh, yeah. You, it, again, it depends. You're both right in my mind. Is uh, if, if you have several hundred acres, you, 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 you need to manage those. You need to manage the those. But, again, well, all I'm saying, if you got a 40-acre track, don't be too hard on them because mm-hmm. they, they're as important uh, come the right time of the year as is – uh, the food, uh, and, and, the, and, you know, one advantage we have in managing deer is, uh, the t- t- technology. If you run a lot of cameras and, and you have year round food, you know, a lot of people, uh, they plant the only time that they plant is in, uh, leading up to the fall or in the right. fall, uh, to attract deer, uh, where, uh, if you have year round, fr- uh, food like, uh, uh, uh clover, uh, or alfalfa or something, that'll hold them year round, you could get a pretty good ratio uh, as far as how many bucks and how many does you have. And you sure. got to be really conscious that if that animal looks small, you better look at his head really close to make sure he's not a button buck. Yeah, that's uh, a big or, one. It's so many animals, that they, they, they say that's a doe, 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 and, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't yeah. a doe. But you could get a really good uh, ratio if you got your cameras uh, year round surveillance all, all the time. It uh, yeah. makes a lot. If you got year round food, I love year round food because that little fawn that grew up uh, uh, eating your clover, he's going to hang around there as he grows older instead of just the focus on is, is attracting them from the neighbors, you know? Yeah. It I think on your property, amazing. I wouldn't worry as much about those prior to the late season. Cause I just, I, uh, to your point, I think you'll see four here, six there but they're spread out. You have enough food. You have enough cover in the late season, right before we get to where food is a limiting factor. That's when I would harvest deer. Cause that's when you need to make sure your herds in check. Frankly, it's the easiest time to like, I get nervous yeah. right now. I'm like, man, we got a cold front come. Like I've not been hunting. I'm not going to go just burn stands to burn stands. And yep. when I do get in a stand, it's going to be, cause I feel like I've got a crack at a, at a good buck. I'm not mm-hmm. going to, yeah, go shoot it down. Potentially blow that opportunity. So it does seem like once that time has kind of come to pass, we, we've hunted a fair amount of these stands, either we've tagged out on a buck or not. That December into January time frame seems like the, the most logical for me to start killing does. Sure. A lot of people yeah, do that. I agree. Some people will argue with that, uh, the January stuff, because for every doe that you kill, you might be killing <coughs> uh, four does. That's the idea, right? Inside of a, or three. If you're yeah, trying to reduce. Right, but, more bang for your buck. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good point. Uh, it depends though. If you're, if you're thinking of it as I need to take out 20 does right. and, and in fact, you end up taking out 45, 50 because they were carrying fawns, then, yep. then the ratios walk, you know, it's just, it, it's a sensitive time. Yeah. It's, it's just an awareness thing to understand. And the other thing is, is obviously if you have too many does, then during the rut, you're going to see squat for activity because that buck doesn't have to work to go and find the next receptive doe he just rolls over and there she is and then rolls over again there she is i've heard that i do yeah i don't know yeah Uh, dan i wanted to kind of dive back in on the on the property side from let's say i I find a good piece of ground it's that kind of cool was you know surrounded by diamonds if you had to nail it down and and let's consider hunting but also just in terms of property investment what would be some of the top improvements that I could make to a piece of property that sh- basically is going to cost me, but I'm likely seeing a return from? Mm-hmm. Depends on what part of the country you're, you're from. One of the things here I look at closely is uh, pasture ground. That's uh, old cattle ground that's ro- ro- grown over. It's nasty. And uh, uh, take a soil sample of that ground and find out what you've got there. Because that, that property there, one of the easiest fixes would be to wipe out a lot of that, that brushy, nasty stuff and turn it into tillable ground, provided you have plenty of habitat to support sure. holding the animals. Yep. Uh, that, that might be, you know, and then in some areas like uh, Oklahoma, uh, uh, Kansas, uh, water is a big thing. Putting in the, the water tanks mm-hmm. uh, could change, change everything really fast, you know. Um, and, and things that the, the focus on when you're looking at land is uh, how do you hold those animals? Is there is there water number one? Because uh, uh, we we've moved into Colorado, and, and I, I I realize now uh, how precious water is to them. You know, sure. 
Uh, so, so to be, uh, to have a stream running through your property is like huge, huge, huge deal. Um, to, to improve habitat really at the end of the day, doesn't cost I mean, you can get a lot of good stuff done, uh, work with a bulldozer because they knock out, do a lot of, a lot of work, uh, in a short time. They charge a lot, mm -hmm. uh, per hour, but, uh, you could, you could turn a, a, a property into a really nice place in, uh, 15 hours. You know, it, uh, it's not, uh, um, it's not going to break you rather than buy a property that is already there. Sure. The, the turnkey properties you will pay for, uh, which is great. If, if, uh, if uh, I mean, depending on where you are in your life yeah. and what your, what your purpose is in making this investment, um, you can make, you could go a long way with a little bit, depending on where it, it varies, where you are, what the improvements would be. Uh, but the little improvements that just shine a property are little cosmetic twists, you know, like for example, I'm selling a, I'm selling a, uh, uh, representing someone and selling a $5 million property. And the first thing when we pull up, there's a piece of barbed wire just hanging there, rusty barbed wire as a gate that that's got to go. Even if it comes out of my pocket, I'm putting a new gate on this property. <laughs> right. When I, I pull up on a, on a multi-million dollar piece of property, it better just pop, you know? Yep. Um, and so, if there's debris on the property, if you want to, if you want to make it better habitat, and uh, when I say debris uh, in the Midwest, I, I don't know about other parts of the country, but uh, some of the uh, drainages uh, and hollows have got old vehicles in them, uh, refrigerators, washing machines. Just the, the farmers would just take them out back and dump them into the the drainage, yep. you know. Yeah. And so it. it uh, People will say it's only about the deer hunting. I'm, all, I'm only interested in deer hunting. We hear that a lot, but uh, there's that property, uh, they have to feel it. I mean, they may say that pretty is not important, but pretty is always important. I don't, I don't care who it is. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want washers and dryers and crap in, in the drainage. And it might be the difference between why they bought this one from someone else and why they didn't buy yours. You might have bigger bucks and, and at the end of the day, better habitat but the appearance. So uh, that doesn't cost anything. Uh, I had the phone number for every, uh, when I was selling property for every, everybody that's uh, a scrapper, yep, scrap metal. For sure. And they'll come in and they'll clean out not only the metal, get it out of your drainages and, and, and uh, hollows, uh, but they'll also, I didn't, I didn't want nothing for the metal and the people didn't want nothing, anything for the metal. Uh, but they'll clean out everything. The things that don't mean anything that are made of plastic, those old dolls that are creepy that are sitting in the, in the ditch, you know, <laughs> they'll take those also, they'll take everything. And then it but, uh, reappears in your tree stand. Yeah. That's <laughs> how, about, how about road networks, Dan? Like I, I know obviously per the conversation of bulldozers Huge. and paying people, you know, access is key. Um, I mean, if, if you're in a piece of ground that's got limited road access, is that a, a smart investment for someone to, to do? Huge. Otherwise, if you don't have a, a, a quiet, uh, uh, a, a, a low intrusive way to get to where you're going, all you're doing is pushing the game on to your neighbors. Yep. Uh, so you, you want a, a road network for the hunting aspect of it and a road network uh, for the appreciation of the land, you know, especially uh, one day you want to sell it and you hire someone like uh, a company like Whitetail Properties, that agent can take them through the whole property um, without somebody breaking their neck. Yep. It, uh, that makes sense. Very, very, very important, very valuable. And, it, and again, to your point, uh, the, the direction you were going is it doesn't it doesn't cost that much at the end of the day when it's all said and done, adds a lot of value to the property and makes ownership uh, much more enjoyable. Yeah. We leased from a guy in uh, Ohio, not too far from where my parents on some ground and the roads, it's a, it's a timber property. It's all timber. It's like 300 acres and it's got the most immaculate road network you've ever seen. This guy's like 87 years mm -hmm. old and he's out there every day. Like I've never seen a tree down. Putting a gravel it. here, cutting trees, putting gravel there, cutting it's trees. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. But it makes the property so accessible, you know, you can mm -hmm. do whatever you want. Absolutely. Let me, let me mention this. So we're talking about all these things that you do and what they cost and not to, not to mention the real cost is the sweat labor that you put into it. Right. You know? 
Uh, so you're making it the, everything you can do to make it the core of their core. This is a property that you've dreamed about owning uh, your whole life. You know, I mean, like me, that first property was like five acres or something there in Masark Town. And it was the most incredible thing in the world. It, it, it was mine. You know, like you said, that tree, you know, I don't want this tree to go. I, I'd sit there. We'd sit there and have a picnic and, and, and think, man, that that big pine tree is it's ours, you know, and all, all that flat over there is, you know, it, it, it's just, it's an incredible thing, but you invest so much of your time and energy into it. How in the world is it fair for somebody to jump your fence, come in there and feel they should, they should hunt on you. You Agreed. know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's no longer land that's just sitting there by itself and, and just taking care of itself. You have, you have become the steward of that land. And that's a big, that's a huge responsibility. Um, so, we started uh, in, in, in when we started this, we taught, I, I kind of alluded a little bit to, to that first way of, of owning land. And that was through a land owner, I mean, a, a, a land contract or a contract for D. Uh, and then we talked about uh, these guys, people who aren't happy uh, because they can't, they cannot hunt grandma's property any longer mm-hmm. because somebody bought it and uh, doesn't allow them to come on to the property. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you don't mind, I'd like to mention some other ways that these people uh, that don't, they may not realize they can own land. For sure. Uh, And and, and, I mean, if that's, if that's, if you don't mind taking it that way, because uh, that might change the perception quite a bit. Uh, uh, One example is this, several guys will go in on a lease a lot of times. And, uh, and so these leases, uh, uh, they're paying a lot of money. Uh, I've got a farm that that uh, that we were offered a lot of money. I'm like, my God, you know, you take that that amount that they're willing to pay. <coughs> excuse me, uh, they can own this land if I was selling it without it. I mean, if yeah. that, that's more. You're offering me more than the mortgage payment a year. Yep. Why would you do that? You know what I mean? Uh, now, now it isn't it isn't a rock that everybody knows how to turn. It's something that you have to put the pencil to it. You got to run numbers to know that it'll work. And you got to look sometimes at a piece of coal. What else can I do to make it better? Maybe maybe uh, part of your diligence is bringing that forester in there. Mm-hmm. And, and you may realize that you could pay for your down payment initially with just what you could cut that first year. Uh, there's, there's, there's different people that if you have a diligence period, uh, that you could bring in that can help you, uh, make that decision. And then you'll, you'll, you'll be better. You'll be better on your own after that. When you learn from these folks, uh, when they, then they explain different reasons for this and that to you. But, uh, that's another thing that we're very good at is, uh, helping people. Again, I'm not an attorney. I would send them in that direction, uh, to where, they could put together uh, an LLC for mm-hmm. the purpose purpose of buying that land or other land that uh, additional properties that uh, will will establish an operating agreement and a buy sell. Those are very important. Even though they're your best friends, uh, you need to pin it down in writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that operating agreement, if if the goal of the group is that you you don't harvest anything younger than or less than so many inches or whatever the criteria is. And maybe the, the goal of that property is that uh, only one guest per year uh, or no guest per year. It all depends on how many of you are there. You, you, wanna, you may want to keep the same uh, union as you had um, when you were leasing, but uh, as far as the rules and regs and all, but uh, it changes sometimes when there's when you actually own it because now you are you are committed where you can have that lease for this year and next year and maybe you change your mind. Uh, it is a bigger commitment, sure. but the flip side is this: is that land can pay for your for your for your property. You don't you don't even have to come out of pocket and put money in that guy's pocket. Uh, from your pocket, it could all be going back into your pocket, and then appreciation comes along, and you you're in a position to uh, sell it. And as a group, a lot of people don't like this part of it, but you're you, you're very strong as a group because banks often look at the worth of all of you, your finance right. worth together. And what they do is they'll make each one of you guarantee each one of you. In other words. Sure. Each one of you is is responsible for the entire loan. Now the ad, the odds of 
if six of you go in on a piece of property, uh, five of you not not paying your end of the making yeah. standing up to your end of the bargain is now. I've never had a bad partner relationship. Of course, you've got to pick your partners. Sure. Um, so, so that's just another something something to consider it, because I've heard guys that lease complain. This is a complaint I've heard from guys that lease. They say, you know what? We improved the property, right? And uh, so two years later, the landowner tells me, you know, my property is much nicer than it was when you leased it. And uh, so I'm entertaining two other offers For to, sure. to lease it. To them. You know, so you're, you're, you're helping him improve his property and raise your price. Uh, and, and again, I mean, there's different reasons why people lease. And I'm not against uh, uh, people who lease property. I love it uh, uh, very often. It's the only way you'd ever be able to hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's an opportunity there sometimes to buy land. And the leverage that you have when you have several guys, you could own together a much bigger uh, track of land than you could buy separately. Yeah. And, and, and you, could, you could finance more together than you could otherwise you know mm -hmm. so uh, well, that's one way okay let, let, me, let me mention this to you there's a lot of guys that have worked for general mills um, anheuser-busch whatever big 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 companies with big benefits where the employer is matching your 401 contribution yep. for example and this this goes on for years and and you've got a ton of money in there uh but you don't touch it which is good and you don't even realize what you have there yet you cannot afford uh to buy a piece of property you really can't with the kids and the car and the sure. house and the mortgage i mean all these things you can't buy that piece of property yet you've accumulated a half a million dollars in your 401k mm -hmm. over the last 30 years or whatever that whatever it is sometimes it's it's pretty pretty big now <clears throat> there's a there's a there's a a, 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 a method known as a self-directed ira a tool um, that will allow you to to take that those funds that or in your 401k or some of them doesn't have to be all of them mm -hmm. uh, and invest it in a, in a piece of property uh, that is income producing has to be income producing property. Uh, <clears throat> and then you actually have an active part in that property because you can help improve it. And, uh, and you could be part of finding that farmer as far as the cash rent or, or whatever has to be done. Now you don't actually pay those people direct, like a bulldozer work or something. Uh, you send a letter of direction to the custodian of the self-directed IRA, uh, allowing them to pay out of that, uh, the funds that are going in there from the cash rent mm -hmm. for the bulldozer work gotcha. or whatever it is. That's a, a, but, but one thing I want to make clear is you cannot, you cannot enjoy no more of that piece of ground uh, as you can a paper investment. In other words, you can't go in the middle of that uh, cornfield and uh, and set up a blind. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you how <clears throat> how I look at it. Uh, is I'll give an example of what I did on a piece of property. Okay, so I had my my in my this particular case my fields. A lot of the fields were in the middle. I did have fields on the outside. Of the perimeter of the property, but I had a lot of really good fertile bottom ground in the middle. So I had the bottom ground uh, surveyed off so many acres of prime tillable ground. So my self-directed IRA purchased the prime tillable ground, mm -hmm. which is a big reason why there's animals on that property. Mm -hmm. They it purchased that amount of the, that became my self-directed IRA was the middle. Then I had a conventional loan on the perimeter, which was not as expensive as that prime real estate in the center. So I had a conventional loan on that, which were the trails going in and out of, of yep. that prime tillable ground. Uh, it was the habitat that held the animals. It was where uh, I would be hunting the uh, mm -hmm. uh, in between bedding areas anyway. Uh, it, it was a, it was a, tr a tremendous piece of bottom. Uh, I sold it to to a fellow that uh, 
uh, is my neighbor now and uh, a great neighbor. And, and he has that. So, but, but uh, that, that piece right there. Uh, so here's what I did that piece in the middle, which was the heart of the hunting, though I didn't hunt it directly. It was the heart of the hunting and uh, that piece in the middle I enjoyed, I enjoyed years of income, which the arrangement I had with the custodian was that when it reached a certain level that I had plenty still left in that account with the bank, with the trust department mm -hmm. uh, to pay any incidentals. If something had to be repaired, if, uh, for example, there was a creek, uh, McCraney Creek ran through it. If the creek had to be repaired because it washed out or whatever, I, I, that paid for that. But the excess <clears throat> went into a paper deposit. Yep. I mean, a paper investment, rather. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was uh, there was three of us involved, uh, Northwestern Mutual, um, the uh, trust department of Farmer State Bank and me. And, and it was it was really cool because now those paper investments, the earnings from the paper investments were not taxed either. Right. Uh, I was I wasn't taxed on that income either. So all these years go by and uh, I turn around and I sell it. So when I sell it, uh, I, I cash out on the perimeter of the property uh, and the self-directed IRA, I, I, I chose, I could have paid my taxes and kept that money. Mm -hmm. You know, the income taxes that I've never paid by putting it into that 401k, I still didn't pay when it was a self-directed IRA piece of land. Now I sell that piece of land. I had the option to roll it like any, any paper investment back right. into a paper investment. Yep. And so uh, uh, all, all that money that I had appreciated and earned um, didn't pay a penny of, of income tax or capital gain on it, not a penny. And it rolled right back into the paper investment. And uh, <clears throat> it's there if I want to, I want to use it again, um, another right. year from now, whatever it's, it's there to do again. Now that's another way that is very, and a lot of attorneys, you know, if you That's don't, if, they, if they've never messed with that, they might say, oh, no, I, those are tricky. Uh, you better stay away from because they, they, they've not done them. They don't understand. Them. That's exactly uh, what I hear, Dan. And, and mainly it's because the first thing I say is like, well, you know, the reason I'm interested in land ownership and stuff is because I'm a big outdoorsman. I love to hunt. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Listen, if we do this, you can't, you can't step foot on it. You can't use it. So when you say about surveying out a piece of that and then conventional, like that never even crossed my mind, but obviously I, makes a ton of sense. I, let me just make sure I yeah. understand this completely. So you're using the self-directed IRA to convert funds from a 401k to be able to purchase an asset like land. Is that correct? And that's controlled by that's a correct. custodian. A absolutely. Yes. That's, that's exactly correct. And at the end of that, you still have not paid any income tax on the money it's appreciating or, or generating. You are able to roll it back into the 401k, which you're calling the paper investment. Correct. Okay. That's correct. And why is your use of the property limited during you, or that's the that, whole point of the self-directed IRA is that you cannot personally use the point part that you've bought. Like you can't go hunt it. Who can? You could lease Nobody, it. The, see the tillable in my particular case, the hunting. Okay, was a three hundred acre piece of property uh, with with about a hundred acres of uh, self directed IRA. Mm -hmm. Now that self directed IRA portion that I had surveyed off and and made into a self was the single. I mean that was way more expensive per sure. acre. Right. And, uh, but uh, so. That piece there, I couldn't. I mean, yeah, are they I could walk on it. Separate could, contracts, could, Dan. Could, are those separate contracts then? Two separate contracts. All right. Absolutely. One mortgage. Two separate contracts. Mm -hmm. And it, it, Dan, when you when you did that, um, essentially like that, you could have, let's say, uh, Paul Sawyer, right? You could have leased that, and Paul, if it was huntable acreage, I guess. You could at least the self-directed portion of that contract to Paul to hunt. You just you personally can't hunt it. Uh, no, uh, the the self-directed IRA nobody could. Well, now I take that back. Yes, good point. There was money involved. Yeah. So yes. if I Paul leased it, it, if I leased it to him and he paid money and you were making money on that, then he could hunt it. I'm still not grasping. Absolutely, absolutely. Although I would not allow Paul Sawyer on my property. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we understand. Yeah, I get. I know that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes, good, good, really good point. Because then that property would really be earning. 
But, right. Uh, no, you can't. In, when I say I can't enjoy. I enjoyed looking at the deer out in the field yep. and, and planning around where they enter the woods and, 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 and intercepting them. I mean, I enjoyed it, but I couldn't be physically on that property uh, unleashing arrows. You when know? you so, when you do a self-directed. He's explaining to me. I still don't understand. So there's two contracts, right? He he put the self-directed um, part purchase the tillable ground. Yep. Because you do that, I personally, because it's my self-directed IRA, cannot use that property for my benefit. Why? That's that's the whole point of the restriction yeah, here it, in it's using. It's like this. It keeps you from being tricky about the right. numbers, where they're coming from. Uh, so I don't, I said one mortgage, one mortgage, because the only part I financed was the perimeter. And I, the lump of money I had sitting in the self-directed IRA is what went into the. Uh, and you just bought the, that uh, straight out, Dan. And in your case, you I just bought it straight bought out. Bought it straight out. So do you? So that was a. It was a chunk of equity, kind of sort yes. of. If I cashed out, it's still a chunk of equity. Went right back into the self-directed IRA. Uh, and, and here's the philosophy behind it: is like you, bu- if it is an investment, uh, and and it could be a paper, it could be a bond, it could be gold, it could be any of that. You you don't you don't dance on it. You know, a paper investment. You don't hunt on it. You don't do all that. And you, and you don't you can't use it on this. You can't do it on this either. They just wanted to keep the lines clear, in my mind. But so, but it can be the heart of your property. Yeah. Because the, what makes it the most valuable to the wildlife is that you've got that food already on that property. Dan, what, um, you know, cause that's, that helps a lot. Cause I know I've, I've entertained this before, um, just as a creative way to potentially buy land. You, you mentioned being able basically to survey a piece of that out. I, I guess two part question. Number one is ballpark. And I'm sure it depends on the size. Like what's a survey cost. And then number two, is there any restrictions like, if, if I'm looking at a 500 acre piece of ground and I'm like, well, I wouldn't necessarily hunt this 200 acres of tillable ground because frankly, it's just tillable ground. Like, are there any restrictions to me just saying, hey, I want this surveyed as like a separate parcel? I, I well, As far as restrictions, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know all... In other words, I, I not, there's none that I know of, but I, right. I, I dare not make that commitment. You know? Sure, no, that makes sense. I, I just, I guess, if I'm looking at a piece of ground and I can identify, like, hey, if I could bring this out and use my 401k to to purchase that, and then conventional loan the buffer like you did, then obviously that seems very feasible. And to my knowledge, surveys are fairly cheap, right? Yeah, and, and they vary. I, I had a property survey not too long ago. And uh, the uh, the range was crazy. I, I uh, the survey ended up costing me around three thousand dollars. Is, is a pretty good chunk of land, but uh, <clears throat> I, I was quoted as over ten thousand. Wow! Else. He's like, they, I ain't walking really, up that. <laughs> yeah, That's but it's all said and done. It's meets and bounds. All of them are are legal surveys that are accurate. Right. You know? Right. So uh, unlike appraisals, appraisals are opinions, but surveys are are a fact. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. Can I ask okay. one more question? I just yeah, want yeah. to make sure no, that I understand this. So whenever the self-directed IRA is used to purchase that 100 acres you're talking about, for the sake of my understanding, is it fair to say like you don't actually own that property, but it's in fact owned by the Roth IRA? That's why you're not able to use it? Or not the Roth, but it's the self-directed? Mine. That, 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 that IRA belongs to me. Um, but uh, so I have a choice. I could direct to to sell it and take the proceeds out of it or roll it back in, uh, but there's a custodian that manages it. I direct him, uh, but he manages that. In other words, my farmer pays the cash rent to him directly. Mm-hmm. Uh, if there's work done on the property, it's paid by the self-directed IRA. Okay. So even though I may have negotiated the deal, uh, the, the transaction between the account and, and the, uh, and so the, you uh, can, you could, because it's a, a money generating activity, then you could lease it to somebody. Mm-hmm. I assume yes. not yourself. Correct. Conflict of interest. Correct. I guess. Yeah. That's where I and think that was you get... Jeremy, Jeremy's point. That was, that was, uh, that was good. I wasn't even thinking along those lines. Not that the thought hasn't been entered my mind in the past, but, uh, it's income producing I see. and, uh, especially, especially, uh, a good return because in a, in a sense you're double dipping you know what yeah, i mean sure. you've got the income from Straight the farmer and you got the income from the hunter yeah, yeah well and that's okay. where i look so at the objective is to keep you the owner of the self directed ira from benefiting from the property that you're trying to purchase exactly I see. Okay. just like if you have a paper investment 
you can't go and necessarily in an IRA format, you can't necessarily go and use funds before age, whatever it is, and it varies, yeah. but 62 I without see. paying taxable income but you, on those. You funds. can use the self directed IRA to take it out and increase the benefits that it's seeing outside of the. Uh, Dan, I think that's 401k. a yeah. I think that's a huge piece oh, of the fact cool. of figuring out again. Because think about it, almost every property, unless you're talking about a big piece of timber ground or something, almost every property has. I won't say unhuntable, but damn near unhuntable ground because it's just big tillable. Like unless you drop a box blind in the middle of it, you know, you're just hunting the peripherals anyways. So if you can survey that out and purchase that, which to Dan's point is usually the most valuable piece of the ground per acre and the most costly, and then buy the balance in a conventional loan. Yeah, I guess That's you. about as creative as you can get. <laughs> you, you could even do this. Uh, I've, not, I've, I've not done this, and uh, I, I haven't done it, but I've, I'm sure it's been done. I haven't done it with a client, but I'm sure it's been done. And that is, <clears throat> if you had a long-term lease with a bordering tillable ground that was for sale, it may benefit you to own that tillable ground. And then, and then you and, and you have a lease that you are still paying on, if that makes sense. Yep. Uh, and and then now you've made a really good investment uh, because it's tangible. You know what I mean? Uh, my I have so much uh, so much better feeling with something tangible that I could see, I could touch, I could smell. I could hire the farmers. I could make sure the fer uh, fertilization is up. I could take care of the perimeter. You know, I I could control it rather than this is me talking. It is is rather than a paper investment that I know nothing about compared to what I know about land and have no control over raising its value. 100%. You know? Well, especially let's take in, in, and again, no knock to it, but let's look at today's stock market at all time highs. Like, frankly, I look at a lot of my paper investments and I'm like, how much higher can they really go? Like, I see a lot of floor underneath me more than I do ceiling, you know, like room above me. Like, I feel like the ceiling's there, the floor's down. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, it makes me nervous as investing into my future in these paper stocks. To Dan's point, I don't have any effect on. Like, I can't make these things grow. Like, it's out of my hands. And frankly, right now, I see a very low ceiling and if anything, I feel like at some point the floor is going to fall out from underneath me on a paper investment. It won't on a land. Yeah. yeah. And it depends a lot on your time frame too. Sure. Uh, the younger you are, of course, the, the more that you could stand taking losses. Yep. Uh, because and, and as long as it's, you, you don't lose till you take your money out. You know what I mean? Uh, so, so even though you took a loss, uh, I've, I've recovered on paper investments. I, I like to keep a, a, a most of my investment in land and, and I like to keep paper investments just so if something's doing really well, I could capitalize. That's on balanced. It yeah. Yes. A balance. But the older that you get, the more uh, conservative you become with paper investments. Mm -hmm. uh, so the risk level goes way down. But if you're, when you're, when you're young, I know when I was much younger, everything I invested in was more of a, a growth investment. Yeah. It was aggressive. When I did good. I did good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, when I did bad, I did. You did yeah. What? Well, but I mean, but I was young enough. I didn't have to jump out of a window, you know? So Dan, would uh, you, if, if I look at that, like I look at where my parents are at, like they're most of their paper investments are in like bonds, mutual mutual funds, like things that are very, very stable, right? If I look at land, I mean, can we make the uh, comparison that land is a pretty stable investment? Land is uh, the most stable investment. It is the most solid investment. And if uh, if corn, if, if say say you're depending on a cash flow uh, income from uh, from any any mass crop, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's the south is timber, uh, whether it's beans, uh, whether it's uh, peanuts, it doesn't matter. As long as you you understand that business, the the in that uh, you know what you need to help you carry that property uh, income wise, and you you understand that if 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 you, when you're renewing your contract. Uh, with a farmer, for example, if it's uh, it could be a share crop, it could be a cash rent. When you're doing that, you understand that it could be as low as this or as high as this. Uh, then, then you've, you you you've got something that you understand, you can control. You're involved in a tangible asset and not a paper asset. In terms of investment in uh, land, like it just doesn't, at least in the course of my lifetime, and it, as far as I can see in the future, like it doesn't, it's not ever going to go 
down like sub substantially. Well, that's right? why I'm saying about the stable investment, and and it's why people, from a paper standpoint, invest in mutual funds and bonds. They don't have the ability to gain, you know, 10% a year. Most of them are very stable in that sure. two to five percent or whatever it is, which is still a nice gain. But, but to Dan's point, the you're further not lose it. Further along in life, you don't want to gamble your entire 401k because you're gonna you're gonna need that stuff really I soon. See. Versus as you're younger, like right now, most of the the paper things that I'm invested in are super aggressive. So to Dan's point, when you win, you win. When you lose, you lose. But at least from a what do I enjoy out of life, tangibly, it's being in the outdoors and hunting. So if I can use that creatively to maybe not purchase something I can hunt directly, but well, a core of what I yeah, can hunt or man. something or a border. That's a great way to not bank on. Like so many people are like, work, 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 retire when I'm 65. Now I'm going to enjoy it. Well, and frankly, and people I think never use their funds. I think that's such a, a failure. I mean. There's got to be statistics, Dan, that why, say. Why not take those, that money that you're accruing and find a way to invest it in a way that you can f benefit from your wealth in way of like land ownership over the course of e even at my age, at 28. I think it's just purely lack of knowledge, Dan, right? I mean, that's what it seems like. Yeah, pretty much it, it is. It uh, and, and here's the difference too. Uh, <clears throat> the four hundred one self directed IRAs is, is 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 huge. I mean, it's 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 so good. But uh, even if we're just talking about buying a piece of ground through a uh, a land contract or conventionally or anyway, uh, there's things that the average guy may find uh, to be a bummer, laborious, uh, but. There's guys like me that I, I could spend all day on a tractor and uh, and when I'm done and, and I come back two days later and I look, I see everything popping up, growing green on my my food plots or or, or, or whatever it is that I'm improving. My God, that I mean, that is so for me, so gratifying. And and, and what, what is our purpose when it's all said and done, if not to give back, you know, mm -hmm. it, uh, I, I know that the properties that I've owned, that I've been involved with. Uh, it, it's mutual. Uh, I've left them better than, than I found them by far. And, and I've grown, I, I've become better um, as a result of having owned that property. It, it, it's, yeah. uh, but, but not everybody, again, not everybody's wired that way. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I get a lot of personal uh, gratification out of my, so my grandfather was involved in uh, cattle business and he, he was like one of the founding member of uh, the certified Angus beef association or certification whatever that is and a lot of the ground that i hunt in eastern central ohio was at one time a, a part of that original um, farm that he had there and his saying uh what the farm that they had was summit crest farms was was like mm -hmm. their brand uh, and the slogan that they had with that was improve the land improve the herd mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so i know that my grandfather who i got to know until i was 15 or 16 years old was very passionate about improving the land that he was running cattle on and, mm -hmm. and therefore expanding his cattle operation. And while I hate cows per personally, <laughs> I do really cling to that improving the land aspect. And I think like my grandfather would be really proud of sure. what I'm doing in, in more of a whitetail direction, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I think we share that passion. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point for sure. Um, and, and, you know, I touched on a couple things like this, the, the land contract, uh, was very important to me when I was younger. And, uh, but then a 401 self-directed IRA might be something that that's very beneficial when you're in mid, mid age or, or older, yeah. uh, because you've accumulated, uh, wealth, uh, in a paper investment, uh, through a 401k or, a, a, an IRA and, uh, and you're in a position to leverage that to a, a solider, more, uh, uh, less, uh, less volatile yeah. investment as, as land. I mean, that's, that's, but again, that's, uh, that's something that if, if, if you're considering land, like if you, you're, you're in the market, you feel like you, you can buy a piece of land and, and the most important thing that you can do, and it doesn't cost you anything as a buyer is, is find the best land specialist that you can. Yeah. The person that really understands dirt, you know, inside and out, wildlife, uh, uh, growing crops, uh, water, everything. <clears throat> You'll be so far ahead than if you if you just 
thought. I'm, I'm going to, you know, and it's, it's, it's like this. Uh, nobody necessarily wants the best deal. When you're looking for things that are important in your life, you, you don't necessarily want the best deal as far as the lowest price. You want the best value. Yeah. Um, and even though I say that, uh, one, one real estate company might charge the buyer more, but uh, the buyer makes more. Uh, the buyer sells it in a shorter length of time. And the, or, or rather the seller, the seller makes more. The seller sells it in a, in a shorter length of time. And the buyer is much happier uh, because he got what he really wants yeah. and understands the, the nature of the purchase. You know, he, yeah. he gets it. Uh, and you've helped them be able to, to help pay for it even sometimes. So, well, I think that's the big thing is you got to surround like going into whether you're going to do a land contract or you're going to do a self directed IRA. I mean, number one is you got to surround yourself with the people that actually know what they're doing, right? Because this could go bad multiple ways. Whether it's land contract and you didn't have the right terms in the in the actual contract itself, you put all this money in, and, you know, the seller takes it back or. In a self-directed, you know, IRA, you invest it wrong and figure out like you can't use any of the property, or you have used it and now you got to pay taxes and stuff. So, like you got to surround yourself, just like a forest or, or or whoever, surround yourself with the smart people that know what they're doing in order to make you successful ultimately. Yeah, you you should be on this side of the screen, Jeremy. <laughs> no, that, this is what that I'm trying to. Learn. But I'm the but I'm the buyer, right? I've yeah. I've been fortunate yeah. enough to run successful businesses to to put my family in a great position to where I don't want to say take risk, but to invest to where there's things that I can use my investments currently for that frankly, I can enjoy fringe benefits from. If I can find a big tillable piece of ground and, and put a self-directed IRA purchase on that, but then purchase the 50 to 100 acres of adjoining timber conventionally that I could hunt and do other things with and potentially timber and make money. Like those are the things that, again, and I hate beating the dead horse, but you know, life's short, guys. And like at the end of the day, you know, I don't want to save all my retirement money to 62 because frankly, maybe I don't get there. Right. I mean, it's it's just one of those things that, you know, if you can use it smart to enjoy life today and tomorrow when, you know, that's what you got, like run with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I uh, uh, I think about what you just said. We all in our lives surround ourselves with with the person, the important people uh, to for us and our families. Uh you, you, your doctor uh, is, you've got to have confidence in your doctor, uh, your regular physician that you, you see whenever, once a year or whatever. Uh, you, you're not, when you're looking for a doctor, uh, you're looking for a mechanic, you're looking for anybody in your life. Uh, you're not looking for the lowest bidder. You're looking for the person that is the most qualified uh, to, to help you in that part of your life, you know? And if you, if you looked at a real estate agent, uh, any any differently, uh, it, it could it could be very costly. Big picture for you, you you might have saved a few pennies as a seller uh, on a commission, but uh, ended up wishing that you never met that person. Mm. Most more people, if you ever took a survey, more people are unhappy with the last real estate agent they dealt with. That is, of course, unless they were a white tail properties real estate agent. <laughs> the reason I know that is because we 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 send out a survey monkey, and the the testimonials that we get back are they're crazy. You, you, you almost, I almost cry every time I read the testimonial. It's a big difference the way that we approach our, our business. Um, I have a question for you as somebody who I know is really passionate about land ownership and we covered leasing a little bit, but I'm just curious, like, you know, under what circumstances, if any, do you think that like leasing is, you know, the right move or maybe a better decision than purchasing a property outright? Yeah. So if, if you don't have the funds for a down payment, but you have the whereby all to, to, to make the, uh, the, the however it's structured, uh, by yearly payment or, or yearly right. payment. Right. I mean, dude, that almost lease. seems like a non-issue at this point. Like leases are so expensive. They are. Well, it, I mean, it, I think it's so expensive. It, it probably comes more down to the long term. And it's like maybe, maybe it's not one but two years. Yeah. But I mean, if you look at, um, it's the same way. And, and this is how I started, right. When I was in my twenties and stuff was renting an apartment or a duplex or whatever versus buying a house. It was like, 
you know, I, I didn't, it wasn't so much that I couldn't afford a mortgage yeah, as much I, as I, I didn't it. want the financial strings attached to a house where like, maybe I'm going to get up and move or get a new yeah, job next your, month. Or leasing is essentially pay, paying for the flexibility to pick up and leave, which yeah. I think is super relevant for a, a house, a, a living situation, you know, but I think land is a little different. I think it's people not knowing how to qualify. I don't even like to, I do it. Of course, I got to keep my wife happy, but I don't even like to rent dish TV. I don't like <laughs> yeah. to, anything yeah. that I, I don't, I'm not yeah. growing an equity in that at, at one point I have something that's valuable. I, I don't like, uh, I don't like doing it. Now, if you buy that house, right. I mean, I mean, you could walk away from a house. You could sell it as fast as you could get a new lease on, on, a, on an apartment. Uh, if, if you, if you, if you and the difference is you've got you've got money you've got equity that you've grown. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I in my mind, just the way I'm I'm personally wired, it's uh, it's always better to own than it is to lease. Yeah. And it's always better if you're in a position and 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 to to pay it off uh, or or to uh, to buy it outright than to uh, to make a payment. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, uh, it's all relative to where you are at that point in your life. Because if you're not like, for example, uh, a, a lease on a piece of property, yeah, they're expensive. I mean, they really are. Uh, but it might be better than paying 25% of a down payment on a $300,000 property. You know, yeah. uh, some people may not have that chunk, but they have, they know what their financial uh, situation is where, um, uh, I, I have this much a year and it's, yeah. you know, some folks at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. They have this much. It's not necessarily going to go into a savings account that they can put towards buying a house or a piece yeah. of land. They're going to send, they're going to spend it. On they're going to spend it on something. I think that's a good point. And, and even I'll give you a, a personal example of mine and, and people listening could crucify me for it. But when I was, uh, when I went through school, obviously I accumulated a bunch of student loan debt and my bachelor's and master's and, you know, started to understand financial stability and, and how I needed to make payments and really understanding the interest rates of some of those loans versus some of my assets. So at some point along the line, after my first child was born, I refinanced my, at that time was like a 2012 F-150, refinanced my truck for like 2.7%, took the revenue or the, the asset money that I got from that refinance, paid off all my student loans that were like five to 7% interest rate, eventually sold that truck and still made money on it. And I was square. I didn't have any student loans left. And it was, it was, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars moving back and forth here. Right. But that financial freedom then all of a sudden opened up to like, Oh, I could sure invest this in a house or I can invest in this. And it's just little things like that. And that's why Dan, I was kind of harping on you for that Tampa story because like there was a light bulb that went off that was like, why am I paying $150 a month here of which over a hundred of it is interest yet 50 of it barely goes to my principal and my student loans when I can refinance an asset here, take that money, pay that off. And eventually this asset is still here in my hands. That's a good point. I, I, uh, uh, so, uh, here recently, uh, I have a choice. I, I could, I could reinvest the money. I sold a piece of property. I can reinvest the money uh, into another property uh, with a 1031 exchange. Uh, and, and, or I could, there's different things I could do with that money. Some people would go hog wild. Uh, so in that particular sale, uh, I looked at properties that I had, which ones had the highest interest rate, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so I took that, that chunk. And in this particular instance, uh, rather than, than spread it again, I, uh, I paid those off. Now, 100% of the income of that is going right into my pocket. That, uh, that takes my return. So I look at it this way, too, uh, just the way I look at it. So if I have four farms and they all have income, I don't look at this one's making 6%, this one's making 3%, this one's making... I average them all together. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm, so, so as soon as I got rid of that highest one, my average got really pretty when this one, these two were paid for. Right. You know? So, so it's just the, and now I've accumulated uh, more properties that are, 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 are gaining, they're, they're, they're still appreciating like they normally would, but it's easier to carry them all, if, if, that, uh, if that makes sense to you. It does. Mm-hmm. I, I think in regards to the, like, 
demographic of people that are leasing versus looking to purchase land. I, I just have a hard time believing having seen leasing rates mm -hmm. that there's a very large pool of people who are able to afford leasing, but not able to, in a matter of a few short years, afford a down payment on a property. I would agree. I, I think, and Dan, you probably can speak to that better than I can, but, but my opinion is that it, it probably has a lot more to do with just people not looking to sell. You know what I mean? People that people not wanting to, to sell uh, availability of, of property probably has a lot more to do with there being a leasing market than I, anything. I also think it's just lack of financial security and that's not necessarily because they can't afford it as much as it is lack of financial knowledge to, Oh, it's cool. If I spend $5,000 on the lease this year, I have that money. I'm not committed past this. Like it, it's just people are usually uber conservative when it comes to finances you know, they're, they're very frugal. And well, so even they though are, they're not paying for leases, then. well, but no, I think they will. I, I don't think that they care. They, they don't have the financial mindset to understand that if I pay $5,000 a year for the next 25 years, they don't care because in their head, they're just not held accountable every year. They have the option to renew it or not. When they make that purchase, it's like, oh man, I'm on the hook for this $500,000 property. They can't, and, it, and it's, a, it's a downfall of the society. They can't understand that they just made a purchase of an asset that's so uh, valuable and so stable and will appreciate that that investment is a huge benefit and they get all the, the perks of their lease. But they just, uh, frankly, it comes down to accountability. I will they don't want to be accountable for it. it. And maybe there's room for one more, and, and that would be businesses, and that sure. a lease is an expense and uh mortgages so not. that's where i was gonna ask dan a couple questions on a business i'm sorry dan. i i kind of just rambled and gave it to give you an opportunity to answer well no no that. i think on, on the <laughs> business no, i love it i, I love it Listen, <laughs> the business front awesome. is a really good one there you know we talked about the llc and the partnership obviously there are certain expenses that can be written off from a when you own land um obviously not everything right your your mortgage payments can't be written off but the the uh, mortgage interest can be written off. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that that's one, Dan, understanding or, or I guess advising, like as as you're thinking about it or as you're looking at a piece of property from a LLC or, or business perspective, you know, are you looking at it as look at all the improvements that I can make and pay for that are write-offs that then eventually achieve appreciation? Yes. Uh, that's one 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 of the things. There's some things that I don't have to do anything, and it'll, it'll appreciate. But uh, it's so cool to what you're saying that when you do something that improves the farming, for example, um, you you take out you take out fencing. Yep. Um, and and you, those are write offs that you have. The other thing is it adds value. It turns around and it adds value to the property, and it's a write off. You when did you ever get a write off on a on a on a mutual fund that went right lost you know a bunch of money exactly. You know? So so that that's a write off, but uh, and and then it adds value to the property. Then you take on top of that that there's other benefits uh, that you could have. Uh, for uh, FSA uh, or uh, the uh, NRCS office uh, division of the USDA uh, offers all kinds of opportunities to improve your property that cost you virtually nothing. Uh, we in pro in, in, I enrolled a farm in uh, Equip. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a program uh, where uh, you apply and based on the number of points which are based on the land, you know, if you, if you, uh, are you going to improve the drainage? Are you going to, there's just different things that, so, so not everybody's going to be, is going to qualify for the equip program, but on my property, on this particular farm, for example, uh, they put in uh, uh, more uh, tile, uh, more drains, uh, the, the uh, terraces, they reworked all the terraces. I mean, they put in, hundreds of thousands of dollars into my property that didn't cost me, cost me a little bit. Uh, in my particular case, uh, there's some things in addition that I had them do while they were out there doing all this work. Mm -hmm. And it would but, be sacrifice of cropland, right? That income? Because for equip, it has to have been in cropland for X number of years. 
Yeah, and it's not that long. It's not it's yeah. not like it had to be there 20 years or something. Yeah. But it have to have been in, there, there are qualifying things that that uh uh that puts you up on the line. You yeah. know, if they only have so many people, so many dollars, uh the, and you meet these qualifications higher than this next guy, you're gonna go in and he's not well, but in terms of uh, expense, I mean so you're giving up potential revenue from crop leasing. Uh as an example. Yeah, no, so so in this in the in the equip program, it increases the crop. Uh, the num uh, the areas that otherwise you wouldn't be able to farm well because uh, they were carrying water and they put mm. in the, the drains and you know the, the the terraces and everything so you increased your crop ground uh, you increased the value of your property and and the and the government paid a couple hundred thousand dollars to do it so you came out zero out of your pocket I mean yep. uh, you can't do that with a paper investment. Yeah. Uh, so you're you're that's uh, those are things, again, whether I do them or I do it through at the NRCS office. And it's smart to always stay tuned in to what they have money for. You know, there's different things that they're, they might uh, maybe maybe it's water. Maybe they'll pay you to put in a, a pond. Uh, it, it just be alert if those are things that you'd like to have on your property that you don't want to come out of pocket. But uh, again, there's nothing you can do with a paper investment. Nobody's going to give you uh, money to to put into the farm to make it or into your paper investment to make it better. There's no bank that'll loan you money to go invest in paper. You know yeah. what I mean? But they will in, in land. Uh, so so there's there's like if you if you get creative and and. It, it, there's no, there's no, uh, you, it, when you get creative, you could take, like we've been discussing, a piece of coal and absolutely turn it into a gem. There's no, no question. We, we've done it many times we, for many, many clients. Dan, have you had uh, one thing that, and this is kind of my last question, we can wrap up at some point here soon, but have you uh, had any clients that have looked at uh, whether they own an existing piece of property or let's say even their primary residence and start to look at the equity within that piece of property or residence as use for the down payment to the next property? Oh, yeah. Uh, so let, let me touch on, on another thing uh, with that. Uh, so absolutely. And uh, that that's how, you know, the, the equity that I got from that first piece in Massart Town, uh, that was the down payment on my next property, which, by the way, uh, was another land contract I did on uh, some ground in uh, Steenahatchee on the Steenahatchee River. Uh, my wife and I bought some ground on the Steenahatchee River. It was close to Tide Swamp, a, a, a wildlife management area, and uh, uh, Steenahatchee National Forest which was another wildlife management area, uh, several management areas right there, which I hunted all of them, but that was my camp right there on the river. And, uh, it was beautiful because it was, uh, it came in from the uh, Gulf of Mexico and, uh, or went out to the Gulf of Mexico. So when the tide was coming in, I'd have saltwater fish and freshwater fish right there. I might have uh, a saltwater mullet swimming with freshwater bass. It was very cool, very mm. cool piece of property, but, but I leveraged that property again, uh, that thing went crazy. If you go to Steenahatchee, the town of Steenahatchee, and drive around down that river now, which was a total wilderness, uh, it still is a total wilderness, but it, it, you wouldn't believe uh, the beautiful uh, condominiums on stilts now hmm. that are out there. You know, it's, 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 it's amazing what has happened. So uh, there's properties that, that I look at now that I've owned, and I made, I made money on them. Heck, I, I sold a piece of property on Tampa Bay. My wife and I were thinking about building on it, so we bought it, and we didn't pay that much for it. Uh, and so we didn't end up building. Uh, I came out to the Midwest with PSC. We we didn't build on the Stena head on uh, Tampa Bay. Uh, but uh, uh, if I had that property today, oh my God! You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, 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 so I thought I was the king of Wall Street. I turned around in uh, <laughs> sixty days, and I and I sold it, and I made twenty thousand dollars. And I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm the man. <laughs> but uh, uh, that same property uh, with the growth of of Tampa Bay, of Tampa Bay area and everything. I mean, it's a million dollar property now. You know? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, you know, I mean, there's no, there's no bad, there's no investment that it in land that a matter of time will not heal if you made a bad investment. Well, so, so you overpaid on something time will heal it. I mean, it's yeah. just no question. Mm. And, and there's no, no property that, uh, that is not sellable. Um, I sold a knob to me, it was a knob and I, did, I didn't embellish it when I showed it to the people, they were from the city 
and uh, it was straight up in the air, and <laughs> you can't build on it. Uh, there was a couple horses that ran wild on the property, but you couldn't run cattle on it. You'd be they'd be breaking their own legs. So, I mean, it was just crazy piece of property. But they they were from the city. We we went up to the top of the knob, and uh, you could see it was beautiful. You could see so far. I mean, you'd have to climb up there to look at it. But uh, they they bought it. They loved it. They sold it, and they even made money on it. So there's no, that's not a piece of property. I don't care what it is that uh, made by God, that that uh, manufactured by God. How can it be priceless? I mean, or, or not not priceless, but not worth anything. Yeah. And that that is not somebody doesn't want. It's amazing. Yeah. It, it, that that is just amazing to me. Uh, in fact, one of the guys that knows land very well, he says, "Why'd you even take on that listing? It uh, there's no way you're going to sell it." And, and it's, it virtually sold itself. It was the right people. It sold itself. And uh, uh, he, th- he couldn't believe that, uh, <laughs> that it sold. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't even like, it was like weeks. It wasn't months that we had it listed. It was weeks. That's crazy, man. Well, I, I, yeah. I think that, you know, ultimately there's a lot of ways to pretend if you want to buy land and that's the thing, like you can't just be like, eh, I'm not sure. Like if you truly want land and you want to have land ownership and you want to buy land, there's a lot of creative ways to do it. And, and if you can't find one, I would have to say that you're probably either not ready and, or you're not trying. It's one of the two. Um, you know, and, and at some point in your life, most people probably will be ready, whether they can use, uh, the equity in their primary home to buy that farm or to buy that piece of ground, or, you know, have that, you know, 401k that's sitting there, that's kind of flush and that you're able to use that in certain creative ways. But yeah, I mean, I just like anything's possible. Yeah. If you want to work hard and figure it out, anything's possible. That's it, man. I'd love to know as we kind of wrap up the podcast here, Dan, can you just, what is the season looking like for you? Are you going to just be mm, hunting good. some of these farms that are close to you? Are you got any travel in the near future or where are you going to be the next couple of weeks? Yeah, two weeks I'll be in Colorado. Uh, we've got a farm there on the Arkansas River. I'll be I'll be hunting a whitetail there. There's a lot of critters to hunt in Colorado, obviously. So we've but heard. my passion is whitetail. It is always has. You know? So uh, <laughs> What? Anything else is almost like an exotic to me. Not that I haven't <laughs> chased them. <laughs> I have chased about every critter that walks, you know. But but uh, uh, my passion is is, is white-tailed deer. Yep. So I'll, I'll be I'll be there. And uh, where I'm located, uh, so I'll be hunting Illinois. Obviously, I'm here in Illinois, but uh, I'll probably hunt uh, uh, Missouri as well. And uh, I'll end up in Iowa late season. So. Okay. Do you right. draw that Iowa ta- uh, tag like every two three years? Uh, about every three years, I, I, I've not been. Some some guys get it more often. Some guys never get it. It seems like. And I've taken. I've had one one uh, session there where it took me uh, four years uh, of uh, to get it uh, drawn in in zone six. Yeah, and that's for that late season uh, muzzleloader tag, right? That's you can draw that's that more frequently. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I, I, lo- I love late season in, in Iowa. I mean, with food, but. Uh, that seems to be, I could get that one easier. It seems like Yeah, that we've, bow tag is, is kind of tough. Uh, mm-hmm. or, 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 you know, so yeah. We've, we, how many we got? Three, three, mm-hmm. three so, points. Seems like by the time we finally get there, it's going to take us five or six points to finally draw. Mm-hmm. Probably. Yeah. Well, Dan, listen, man, we, we appreciate the time today. I know we took up about two, two and a half hours of your time and, and you're a busy guy, but man, what, what a wealth of information, you know, hopefully for the listeners, but definitely for Jared and I, just because this is, this has always been on our radar and, and we're kind of in that mindset now of purchasing land and what's the best way of doing it and making investments for our family and for the future. And, you know, what better guy to talk to? I mean, not only just about land and, and hunting, but, you know, I, you and I have known each other, come across each other for probably about, I don't know, 10, 10 years plus now at this point. And, you know, you're a super guy down to earth. And, uh, man, we really appreciate you taking time this morning to, to talk with us. It's been a complete pleasure. Uh, the only thing that, that I don't like is that you guys had coffee and I had <laughs> no coffee this morning. Well, I saw your assistant setting up your, your video in the morning. She said, hey, some coffee before you leave. <laughs> I was going to ask him to take your call. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to come it's do it here. Away, you'll, you'll have to come do it here with us next time, and we'll we'll make you a pot. There you go. I uh, pr- appreciate that. No, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, maybe another time if we ever do this again, I- I'd like to tell you a little bit about ten thirty one exchanges. They're yeah. they're uh, really important. I hope we never lose them. 
I think that would be a really big one, man. We, we'd love to have you back on here maybe after the end of the season, talk about how your season went. I did see, uh, obviously, give you guys some props. You guys just released a new website yesterday, maybe? New new revised yes, website? Looked really yes, good. Sir. Yeah, it looks really good. It's up and running, but uh, it'll, it'll get a couple of little tweaks here and there, and it'll, it'll be incredible. Right now, it's the, it's the best uh, LAN website anywhere. I mean, it's, it's got everything that you could ever dream of. Awesome, man. Well, we, again, we appreciate your time this morning, Dan. Look forward to having you back on and have a safe and, and great hunting season this year. Always a pleasure. You guys as well. Thanks, Thank Dan. you very much. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Same, man. Knowledge bombs. Dude, we've had some serious ones between Dan, uh, between Don Higgins and then Adam and now Dan Perez and Craig. Like, I, I'm sure, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, I hope your head's not spinning or you're looking like uh, Zach Galifianakis when he's at, like, the table in Vegas and the numbers are just, like, cranking around. But, like... Can I always rewind? Listen, at the end of the day, like, what a what a wealth of knowledge. And, and first of all, like, I'm sure we're going to get the comments because I know they're coming. I, and it's not anything about Waitel Properties. It's purely the fact about access and privatization and blah, blah, blah. People are going to be like, well, you know, Dan's just a hard salesman and blah, blah, blah. It's like, listen, this guy is super passionate. Like, of course he's a salesman and he has a fantastic business in Whitetail Properties. That said, the guy wants you to own land so you can feel what he feels in land ownership. That's really what he wants. I mean, he, he's not trying to go out there and sell you a piece of cattle pasture and be like, hey, man, I know you're going to see five booners on here next year. He's not doing that. He's just trying, like, what are you looking for and how can we make that a reality? Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of people have that perception that, like, you know, I know plenty of places that people are like, oh, white tail properties came in here and all the prices went up. And it's like, well, good for the people who put their claim in there, you know? And yeah, maybe I'm still looking for that deal. But ultimately, like, I think what people fail to look at is, First of all, when a piece of ground goes up for sale, whether it's Waitel Properties or whoever, like that piece is very negotiable in what the listing price is. In fact, at one point in time, and and I should ask Dan, but you know, I remember most listings sold, unlike houses, right? Most listings for raw land sold at about eighty percent of what they were listed for. That's what the actual transaction price was. Whereas like houses, obviously, I think you and I both put in probably more than the asking price on our just because of the demand and and Hey, that's the right one. We want it. Yep. Um, when it comes to raw land and especially it, something that maybe has been sitting on the market or is on the market for a while, most of those are going for about what 80% of listing price, or at least that's the negotiation point that I've heard. Where was that in Pennsylvania or in general for, for raw land? Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, and so now there's a lot of places that tillable ground, especially when you talk about Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, 10,000 plus dollars an acre and it's under the table. You, you never even see it come up for sale this farmer buys it from this farmer and you never hear about it. Yep. But in terms of like, actually, hey, I'm listing this piece of property for purchase about 80%. So if you see a piece of ground for a hundred grand, more than likely you can get it for 80, mm -hmm. you know, or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and you said as just like you would a house, like negotiate, mm -hmm. you know, there's just because they list it for this doesn't mean that's what they were. It doesn't mean that the seller will take a lower price either, but sure. that's the whole point about buying and selling real estate. It's negotiation based. Mm -hmm. hone your sales skills yeah man super uh just cool cool to talk to dan and we got a lot of shared passions it's it's just cool to know that it's 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 possible and when you start to realize like how you can get creative with you know different types of deals or sourcing funds from from different uh avenues it's it's like it just it's, it's i think it's more in reach than a lot of people realize I 100% believe back to your leasing comment, and this is no knock on anyone who will never buy property and just lease. In fact, we lease a shitload of ground right now. Um, it's purely an accountability thing. And that's not necessarily saying like, oh, you don't want to be accountable. It's there's a lot of pressure to having a long term debt uh, on your mind. Right. And, and normal people are just worried about house vehicle. And that's about it. Right. Yeah. But I mean, that's diminished when you start to realize like it's an asset, like you're just investing in an asset that's sellable. Well, and, and I blame a like lot the pressure of pressure is relieved. Just sell it. I blame 90 percent of Recoup banks it. for embedding that in our brain into the point where I see an asset and they're telling me they won't finance that asset. 
And it's like, well, why? Yeah, a lot of people are like, look at a piece of property. They're like, I can't afford that. When you should be looking at like, what is the what is the down payment? What's my obligation monthly? Yeah, well, but the, yeah, you can. But and, they're saying they can't that, afford it because most of the time, just like I've had the experience with, I've gone to the bank and said, yes, I have 20%. Here's what I want. And they're like, yeah, we, we won't find that. I was going to ask them to re-mention who they were, but there's a, a few. They're on their you website. Gotta a, you just got to find it. Look at their website. Find a different bank. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, the bank will say, I don't care if you bring $50,000 to the table, we're not financing yeah. that. And find it's a, like, find why? a different bank and or understand that property's ability to generate revenue, which I think is what the land specialists, so white tail properties again, are. No, that's what they do. No yeah. knock to major banks, Wells Fargo, PNC. They don't know. <clears throat> Capital One. Doesn't matter. All of those people, if you came to the table and say, hey, like I'm looking at buying this yeah. piece of farm ground. Here's, Here's its ability it to generate revenue of crop Get the hell like, out. What? Get yeah. the hell out. <laughs> and it's just because those banks aren't suited for yeah. purchases like yeah. this. They're suited for buy this house because when you fail in your payment, I'm going to take this house and I know how to sell it. Yep. So I think that's it. It's just getting creative there. I love the self-directed IRA thing. Obviously, we want to hit, we'll get Dan back on and do a 1031. I'll talk with Gilstrom about that to get Dan book back up on that. But like, and just there are opportunities here, whether as a person or a business or a group of people, you just have to try and, and talk to the right people and find it and call an agent. That's it. That's it, man. That was a good one. Well, we appreciate everyone listening to the Hunter podcast. I have to pee. Um, well, I don't, surprisingly. When he mentioned coffee, I was like, yes, wow. I have been holding my pee for an hour, Dan. I didn't even think about peeing the <laughs> like entire I was in, time. Felt like I was in the tree stand, like looking for a Gatorade bottle here. It's been almost three hours. Yeah. I yeah. haven't even thought about it one time. Wow. Drank this large coffee right before we started. It's impressive. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, again, <laughs> we appreciate everyone listening to Dan Perez, co-founder of Whitetail Properties. Uh, if you haven't already, for sure, pound our subscribe, follow, whatever it might be on whatever device you're listening to. And we'll keep throwing them at you and be safe out there in the woods. I know everybody's probably hardcore hunting at it. Cold front coming this weekend. What, it'll be like the 19th? The, today's the 19th? Oh, so this will drop right after the cold front. Yep. Today's the 19th. So... Hopefully it bucks hit the ground out by then. I got a good feeling. Me and Strauss Lama got a couple good hunts here. Strauss Lama and his native habitat. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll see you next time. Later. Take me.